Good afternoon, John. Hi, how are you? Hi, how are you, David? This looks like a mammoth afternoon. Well, we'll see how it goes. Oh, we'll see how it goes. <laughs> Have you come across a thing called mm -hmm, M M H M M? Hi, everyone. Hi. Hi, yes. It's um, it's a setup where you can create your own rooms. It creates a virtual camera. Um, and it's one of Silicon Valley's top whiz kids has done it so you can and you can present on it and all sorts of things. I'll send you a link to it later on. Um, but it's very much, I mean, you can do a lot of that on Zoom, but it's the, the hottest ticket in town, apparently. So I was, I was watching a few videos on it last night. It sounds quite impressive. But ideally, you need a green screen behind you, you know, to really, mm -hmm. otherwise you get the dreaded outline around your head. The guy that was doing it was conveniently bald, which I thought was a bit of a cheat. <laughs> so we'll wait another moment or two. A few more people have joined. Thank you for joining. We'll just wait another moment and then we'll uh, we'll go ahead. Just coming up to five past five past the start. Yeah. Okay, so it's five past two, we'll start. I think other people will join us a bit later, but uh, in the interest of time, we'll, we'll kick off. So, um, just share my screen. So we're, we're, today we're talking about benefits of artificial intelligence. And the audience is primarily drawn from the Northeast region. It's, it's um, the audience is primarily people who've already had contact with the Data Value Hub and have an interest in this topic and can see some benefit to how this, uh, how this can help their business. Um, what I would ask is, is that, uh, you know, stay on mute uh, unless you're a speaker and we'll and use the Zoom chat capability if you have questions along the way. We have a, we have a, a Q and A session, but along the way, if an idea comes into your head for a question, just uh, just put it in there. We're we're video recording this session also, so we'll send everyone a copy after the event, and we aim to finish by about uh, four thirty. So our speaker lineup, um, in addition to myself, we have we have four speakers. Uh, Ronan Harbison has stepped in because uh, Hans Joachim Hussler is, is not able to speak today. Unfortunately, he's got a, uh, an urgent uh, appointment he had to take. But we have we still have Daniel. Got Charles uh, speaking and Yasin and Raymond. So R Ray Mulligan is from Microsoft. Yasin is from Cedar, the Irish uh, Center for AI. Daniel is from Bavaria and he's the managing director of TUM International. And Ronan works closely with with uh, with with many people in Bavaria and is the director of programs and partnerships at Generation. The the flow for today is uh, is as follows. So it starts, I'll give an overview of uh, how the hub helps enterprises. And I'll talk a little bit about um, machine learning 
and other aspects of AI and how they're being applied in industry, just to get you some ideas there. And then we'll, then we'll talk about Industry 4.0, the German experience. So as I mentioned, Ronan has stepped in because Han Joachim is not available. So along with Daniel, we'll talk about the German experience. Germany is leading the way with Industry 4.0. It's where the concept comes from. And so much has, has spread out across the world from that and uh, of huge interest, I think, to us in the Northeast region here in Ireland. Um, Yassine is from the uh, CEDAR organization, as I mentioned, and he will talk about the next level of innovation that's coming down the line uh, in the world of artificial intelligence. And then uh, Ray from Microsoft <clears throat> will talk about um, how AI on the cloud is helping enterprises. Microsoft's um, strategy is very cloud oriented. And uh, as in all things they're doing, you know, AI is another area that benefits from that strategy. As I mentioned, we'll have then a Q&A session and then I'll wrap up by talking about how you can move your project to the next phase um, where you have an idea. Many, many people on the call actually have a good idea for a project and it's about how we move those ideas on to the next stage. So I'll start um, with this first topic. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about, I'll, I'll lead into, you know, identifying the right technology. So how does the hub help you identify the right technology? And by way of context, ma many of you have heard this message before. So forgive me if I'm repeating myself, but it is, a, I, I believe, a very strong and, and important message to make that COVID has been a spur for progress with digitization. Um, we're seeing changes happening weekly and monthly that would have taken many years in the absence of COVID. COVID has pushed us essentially five years into the future. Before COVID, nobody talked about the risk of pandemics. People talked about different risks, but not pandemic risk. Um, and also before COVID, huge change was already underway. Um, with nearly 4 billion active social media users, the world was truly digitizing at an enormous pace. Um, and what was happening as well was that the traditional shop was in trouble. So long before COVID, shopping was in trouble. The traditional retail experience was in difficulty. The second largest shopping mall ever built in North America um, was built in 2015. And three years after construction, only two out of the 400 stores were occupied. So something very different had, had started to happen long before COVID. Also before COVID um, in the United States, people were beginning to use Zoom for their GP consultation. About 10% of Americans before COVID were, were, were getting GP consultation over Zoom. That's now more like 80%. And then you sort of say, well, okay, well, why, why engage then in, in, in artificial intelligence? These things are happening, but, but, but when you translate it into local business, into your own enterprise, what would the point be? What, why do this? And the, the, the numbers are, are stark when you, when you look at this. In 2020, um, worldwide e-commerce sales grew by over 27%. And in North America, which was already a very heavily penetrated market for e-commerce, nearly 32% growth. It's, it's incredible to see that happen. Amazon saw their own revenue grow by 37% in 2020. In the months of May and June, which were the critical months for many businesses, 85,000 businesses in the UK switched on their e-commerce site for the very first time. We, we are truly in a world in which anyone who's fluent in English, who has a good internet connection, is now your competitor. Because when everybody digitizes at this scale globally, they immediately open up global uh, opportunity. So we, we are faced with um, huge opportunity and huge uh, threat with this reality. So a new way of thinking is needed to, to look at this. So the opportunity of Industry 4.0 is, is all about um, looking at how do you make better decisions faster? How do you make better decisions faster? That's the essence of, the, of this fourth industrial revolution. You'll hear more um, from, from Daniel and, and, and Ronan about this, but essentially Bavaria has thrived because it reframed the question so Bavaria can't compete with the daily wages of Vietnam. There's no chance. But if you reframe it and you don't just focus on your wage bill, 
you look at your, your overall enterprise, if you can make better decisions faster, you, you outcompete everybody. And, and you're absolutely, you have a wage bill, you have an electricity bill, you have raw materials, you have, you have all kinds of costs. But if you look at things in that way, you, you drive a different mindset. And that's been the, the essence of the success of Industry 4.0. All of the enabling technology that we're talking about when we talk about AI, all of it has been around for at least 10 years. But what's different in 2021 is that the technology is cheaper, more accessible, more user friendly uh, and more widely adopted. So you can you can talk to organizations who've already done it, whereas five years ago or more, that would have been difficult. It would have been difficult for certain technologies to find someone using it the way you might want to use it. And we talk about a mindset change as well. The mindset change, this is a world in which data is the new currency. It's a world in which data value is your objective. So everything else is important in your business, but what's very important is how do you get value from the data so you can make the right decision at the right time. And often a way to start with that is to map your processes, to map out how your business uh, operates between suppliers and customers map it all out in green and then map the data flow uh, that you have and that you need with the, with the black arrows shown here. So you get a very good sense of, okay, do we even have the data we need to be able to make these wonderful new decisions? Many AI projects begin as data collection projects. Now the benefits when it's done properly, better product, happier customer, better utilization of your assets, better safety, um, a more secure uh, future for the business. Um, some businesses might say, well, it's not for us. Okay. Well, many businesses that would say that are probably managing by gut feel rather than managing by data. And they probably have a lot of waste and scrap and rework and delays in their business that they are not measuring and they are not addressing. Now, there was a time when that probably didn't matter, but in a world where your competitor has addressed all of that, they are going to be more profitable than somebody who hasn't addressed it. So the, so the threat comes back in, competitive threat by, by not addressing it. So digitizing the enterprise in a cost-effective way to get better decisions faster is the essence of, of what we're talking about. Now, when people talk about AI, another term that's being used a lot is hyper-automation. So this is almost like the purpose if you, if you talk about what's the purpose of AI, why, why would you do it? What, and, and indeed, what are you doing when you're doing it? You're automating at, a, at an accelerating pace, at a hyperscale, hyperspeed, hyper automation. Um, one of the leading analysts of technology globally is an organization called Gartner. And they, they at the start of every year, they do a, a strategic technology outlook. And one of the key things they're saying for 2021 about businesses is that businesses need to look at hyper automation. They need to look more and more at how to you know, make better decisions faster. And in particular, they're, they're focusing in on three areas that we, that we also focus in on, machine learning, robotic process automation, and natural language processing. And we'll talk about what we mean by those, okay? So firstly, um, if you look at artificial intelligence, you stand back and you say, okay, what's the full list of what we're talking about here? And those three areas that I mentioned, machine learning, uh, robotic process automation, natural language processing, they are three out of a list of 14, okay? So your traditional enterprise resource planning system or MRP planning system, production planning system, that is an AI system. It might never have been called that before, but that's what it is because you're making decisions um, with computers, not with people. It's artificial intelligence. And that, that domain of software has become more and more and more sophisticated to optimize your supply chain and minimize your inventories and maximize your productivity. At the other end of the scale, you have quantum computing, which is very much in the realm of emerging technology. It's probably 10 years away from mass adoption. However, over 50 organizations in the US are using quantum computing to manage their business better. They've come up against a problem which cannot be solved in any other way other than using that incredible uh, but very, very specific technology. But most of what we're talking about 
is in the domain of machine machine learning. Uh, so I just see someone trying to join. I'll let them in. Uh, machine learning um, and uh, robotic process automation and natural language processing. Now you'll also see on the list other things here that you'll be familiar with. Factory floor robots, computer vision. Absolutely, they are also very widely adopted. Um, but we're just we're just picking on three uh, areas to talk about um, today. So um, to talk about these three, firstly to say that um, they, they have applications in many different sectors. Robotic process automation um, is all about automating manual processes. And it's widely used right across different kinds of manufacturing businesses in food, in, um, in equipment manufacturing, as well as uh, services industries, financial services, legal services, retail and hospitality, transport and logistics, and you know, architectural and construction businesses. Um, machine learning, um, it's also widely used. Um, natural language processing, less so. Natural language processing has a very strong uh, capability uh, where you have a lot of people making a lot of decisions. It's able to uh, automate uh, in ways that um, are incredible. And, and, these, and often what you find in a, in a strategy that an, an organization ends up with multiple aspects uh, of, of AI technologies as part of an overall strategy. So let, let me just um, go one step deeper here. So when we talk about machine learning, um, machine learning is a subset of artificial intelligence. Um, we're talking about, uh, when we say artificial intelligence, um, we're talking about a tech where, where the technology is, is making the decision rather than, rather than the human being. Machine learning as a subset um, refers to um, a narrow set of things where you, where you have data, you're analyzing data, and you're making decisions from that data. Things like forecasting and predicting. So sales, predicting sales, forecasting, predicting uh, where maybe the price of oil is going to go. Um, it's widely used in weather forecasting as well. But in the business context, there are areas around um, Things like image classification. So when we talk about computer vision, really it's it comes into its own with machine learning. So you have cameras looking at multiple images, but machine learning is able to spot the patterns. A very good example is in uh, detecting lung cancer. So you could you could take 250,000 x-rays of, of lungs and uh, with machine learning spot the 11 people who have who potentially have lung cancer. If you were to ask human beings to do that, it would take a very, very long time and there would be a degree of error, false positive, false negative. So machine learning with image classification is very, very powerful. Um, but it, 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 it's also suited to uh, financial modeling where you have many, we have maybe millions of financial transactions and you're looking, you're trying to detect fraud in the, uh, in the activity. Um, or maybe you have, uh, uh, historical customer data and you want to find from a customer sentiment point of view which customers are likely to leave which customers are likely to grow so at at, at, at the heart of um, machine learning is the concept of of having an algorithm which which is identifying the pattern for you and there are different versions of this where whereby uh, the the, the the algorithm is adaptive and is modified or it has been originally designed and left alone so uh, specifically then, if we talk about where, where machine learning can help your business, it has a very strong capability in the world of supply chain management. So the way that you would um, assess supplier quality, um, once, you're, once you're collecting data, you can, you can start to see patterns in supplier quality. So if you have a sudden problem with a supplier, uh, machine learning would find that faster than traditional methods. It presupposes that there's a high degree of automation in how you are interacting with your supplier in the first place to be able to do that. Um, I mentioned fraud already, uh, quality inspection at finished product. So when you have, as you are manufacturing your own product and you're getting ready to ship uh, out of your plant, um, whether it's food or, or machinery or parts, whatever it is, um, 
I mentioned already computer vision, machine learning with computer vision is extremely effective at automatically checking for defects. Um, it's also very widely used in the world of scheduling and planning to be able to balance order scheduling. So if you have a business which has make to order and make to stock at a certain scale, that becomes very difficult to manage with humans. Uh, and the, the scale is, 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 is a problem because of the sheer volume of data. Machine learning is very effective at bringing in uh, um, productivity there and balancing order scheduling to, to maximize the throughput through your, through your factory. Um, last mile delivery and tracking. Um, there's a huge amount of uh, e-commerce that has gone live in the past 12 months, but it has resulted in a lot of frustration among customers who don't know when they're gonna get their delivery. So they're ordering online, but then they don't know, well, when am I gonna receive this? Um, machine learning is brilliant at, at managing last mile, last mile delivery and tracking. So if you have a fleet of 100 vehicles delivering parcels, for example, um, as, as they are running late in traffic or running early because of uh, uh, maybe a sudden you know, gap in the traffic, that data can be automatically fed to an app so the, so the customer is receiving an instant update. You know, we're 20 minutes away, we're five minutes away, et cetera. DPD in Ireland, one of the parcel delivery service companies, they use machine learning in that way. Um, so it's all about delighting the customer, customer retention in that particular context. Um, so machine learning helps businesses run better and it, it's a huge domain and it's an expanding domain. So in the, in the initial concept around, you know, machine learning, it breaks into supervised, unsupervised and reinforced uh, learning. And these, these terms are, are being, um, uh, you know, more and more widely accepted within the world of machine learning uh, practitioners. So you, you'll hear terms like uh, big data visualization and you'll hear, you'll hear uh, terms like, uh, you know, um, customer attention analysis, uh, popularity predictions. So they, they're all very important terms, but they have a place on this overall chart. And it's all about context. But what's happening is that machine learning is now for everybody. It's no longer reserved for PhD candidates with with Microsoft, for example, and you'll hear some more from Ray later, um, Microsoft's capability, it, firstly, Microsoft's philosophy is all about accessible technology at, at a low cost. But what's happening with machine learning and, and Microsoft is incredible. Uh, they, they have, among others, Microsoft has managed to create um, a service platform which makes machine learning accessible, easy to get started with, and, uh, and, and affordable. Um, the kinds of skills we're talking about here relate to things like um, uh, how do you code, how do you create an algorithm? And, and prior to that, how do you do the research to get the data together to know what you need to build? Um, so beginning in machine learning starts with simple predictions. With what many businesses do when they go into machine learning, they start with a simple problem. And, and one of the most simple problems of all is uh, predict the future. Can you predict a month out, three months out, a year out based on data historically? So we're all, we, we would all, I guess, have an intuitive ability to predict the future based on data. Um, if we're seeing sales growth of 12% per month, every month for two years, we would expect next month to be the same. Right? We can imagine through using Excel, uh, we, we can predict the future easily. But when you start to add in more and more variables into the equation and it's more and more complicated, simple prediction through Excel breaks down and is no longer possible. And that's really where machine learning takes over. So there's a kind of an evolution from, you know, managing by gut feel, manage with Excel, manage with an ERP system, manage with machine learning. As, as you evolve, as you become aware that your model is not working uh, fully accurately, you become effectively a customer for a machine learning project. Uh, another important point to make here is that um, having a machine learning model is like owning a ship. It's not just the ship, it's the crew. You have to think about resourcing. And uh, on the resourcing side, there's two things to think about. One is how, how to get your 
your own team skilled in this area to add value? And how might you need to hire people um, who have deeper skill where maybe it goes beyond what your own team can, um, can absorb? So robotic process automation, the second point on that list mentioned by Gartner, so we've machine learning, robotic process automation. This is something that's been around for uh, more than 10 years, but during COVID has really taken off, particularly in the world of finance and getting paid. One of the things businesses discovered during COVID was they weren't getting paid fast enough. And uh, when, when, the, when the cash squeeze came on, there were so many reasons why and many of them were painful that businesses discovered. So robotic process automation is all about taking a set of steps that are manually performed and digitizing them. So where you have multiple systems, so in, in many businesses, you have a payroll system, you have some sort of a, fi you have a finance system, maybe a production planning system. But what you find is that uh, the timesheets from over here have to be sent over here by a person using an email uh, on a Friday. And then this guy has to phone that guy to say, release the cash and all these things, you know, multiple phone calls and emails going all around the place. When you map it out, you could say, well, I'd love to automate that, but I don't want to invest in a giant new ERP system. And that's where robotic process automation comes in. Um, there are a number of very powerful tools out there. There's a tool called UiPath. There's also Power Apps. Um, Power Apps uh, from Microsoft, um, is, is bundled in with your Office 365 subscription, but it, it allows you to pick something that's painful where maybe 19 people have to get involved to make a decision, map it out on paper, and then look at where that data is actually coming from. And then if you stitch it all together and you have robotic process automation and improved productivity. Sarah's birthday today. What month? Could I, could I ask you to go on mute, please? Whoever isn't no, on mute. Like Friday, Saturday, Sunday. That's not Thursday, Chartak, 8. Yeah, somebody, um, somebody needs to go on mute. Okay. All right. Thank you. <laughs> um, then just the, the, the last of those three, just to mention, natural language processing. Um, so this is um, the newest of, of these three to talk about. This is where computers can understand human language not just understand the words, but understand the context and the meaning and you know, what's behind what's said. Um, an area that's been radically overhauled is uh, in using this is the legal profession. So if you're in a litigation, one of the challenges with law of precedent is that there's you know, thousands of books of case law going back a hundred years that, that your lawyer has to know to be able to give you advice. But NLP can interrogate that and in, you know, in five seconds, give you the answer that a professional barrister would take a month to get. So it's, 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 it's a huge opportunity and it's a huge threat as well to the existing way the legal profession operates. It's probably the, it, the legal profession is probably the area that would be most impacted by, by NLP. But in terms of re other real world examples of this, you're looking at things like, um, next generation uh, auto automatic translation. So if you're on a call with somebody in Japan, and this technology has already been demonstrated. So if you're on a call with somebody in Japan, you can't speak Japanese, they can't speak English. When you speak English at this end of the video call, they hear Japanese at their end. And at their end, when they speak Japanese, you hear English coming back. That's NLP, incredible for, for automated uh, translation. Um, the, it, it, it also has uh, a value in um, analyzing and categorizing documents. So if, you if your business uses a lot of paperwork, a lot of specification drawings, maybe a lot of documentation, a lot of, a lot of words on paper where you have to interpret that and convert it for other use, NLP can do that conversion instantly. And it can do it automatically and it can do it at huge scale and it can do it at two o'clock in the morning and at five o'clock in the morning and on a Sunday afternoon and on a Friday night. It's not limited by, by, uh, by, by your people's time. Um, we're going to hear more and more about NLP and more and more applications coming into business. So that's, that's another example of this hyper -autom automation that's going on. To think of an organization which has done all of this, commercial organization that's done all of it, commercial organization which has done all of this, Amazon. Last year, Amazon's revenue grew by $100 billion. And last year, Amazon's 
um, headcount grew by 498,000 people. That's a 62% growth in, in headcount and a 37% growth in revenue. And in Ireland, Amazon are currently building Ireland's largest ever warehouse near Baldonnell. Amazon.ie will soon be launched. They have bought 800 trucks and vans. You will have Amazon trucks and vans on the roads of Ireland very soon. And you will have same day delivery anywhere in Ireland. Amazon are extraordinarily good at machine learning, robotic process automation, and natural language processing. They are extraordinarily good at it. And they are shaking up so many areas of business. So they represent a pace setting competitor. Now they don't necessarily compete with, with anyone on this call, but if you drop the context from there into your world, if one of your competitors was to do this, or if you were to do this, what would it mean? And you have to think like that because the world is now more connected than ever before. You know, anyone who can speak English, who has a good internet connection is your competitor. That's, that's the reality. So how to, how to address that is, is, is a key question. So identifying the right technology, what we do with the hub is we focus in on what upskilling is needed, what incubator projects do you need, and where are you with your, with your current uh, thinking? The, the chart we like to use in the hub is this one, which, which comes from Enterprise Ireland, which says, okay, if Intel are level five, where, where is your business? So Intel, highly processed mature, highly digital mature, a factory in Leak Slip, it's a world-class facility, Lean Sigma, you know, every process mapped, understood, optimized, 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 using artificial intelligence for machine learning, for robotic, robotic process automation, computer vision, autonomous vehicles, drones, they're doing it all, but they're doing it in a, in a way that's all about cost benefit. They're not just throwing robots at things, they're they're building the business case and they'll only invest when they can prove to themselves it saves time, it saves money, it reduces errors, you know, overall increases profitability. So they're at level five. So where is your business can compare to that? And also more importantly, where does your business need to be? You, you may not need to be at the level of Intel. Not everybody needs to be, right? But if you're at level two and your competitors are at level four, that's something to maybe worry about. You know, and what we want to do is help understand that journey. So everyone has a unique journey. No, no two companies have the same journey. But for your particular journey, what is the urgency and what is the importance of, of this? So if you're going to look at investing in, in, art, in artificial intelligence, when to, when to do it, why to do it, how to do it, they're, they're the key questions. So we will work with you on the project to define scope. So what is the concept? Is it a process improvement? Is it a new product? Can you describe the benefit? Can we, can, you know, do you have people who can commit time and do you have data? As I said at the start, many projects become data collection projects because when you start asking the right questions, you start to say, well, you know, one of the challenges is we don't have data. So the project can often become a data collection project to get started. So that's that's an introduction. Um, we we'll move to the next piece. We're running we're running a, a, a little bit behind schedule. We started a bit late, um, but we're we're going to hand over now to um, to Ronan and and to Daniel, and uh, we, we'll be talking about um, yeah you know the German um, experience with business competitiveness and technology revolution. So. I think I think Daniel, you're you're okay to um, come off mute. Well, I'll, if I if I can, John, I'll co I'll come in and just do do a quick a quick intro. Yeah. Uh, uh, because what I'm what we're going to do, guys, um, we're just going to be sorry, sorry, my printer's just having a bit of a hissy fit there, guys. Sorry, uh, but we're we're going to do just a kind of a a conversation discussion, uh, um, Daniel and myself. Um, so I think that would be very helpful. So if it's okay, John, I'll, I'll just very briefly introduce myself yep. um, uh, and then uh, briefly, very briefly talk about Big Wheel because I know that uh, unfortunately Jochen can't be here with us today. Um, uh, and then just uh, I'll introduce Daniel and, and we'll, we'll, we'll do a bit of a Q&A on it. Um, so just very briefly um, to 
Oops, sorry guys. <laughs> it is working after all. <laughs> um, this thing will be finished now in one moment. Guys. Sorry, thanks so much. Sorry about that, guys. Um, so, you know, uh, just a little bit about my um, uh, about myself, first of all. So, Ronan Harvest is my name. I'm the founder of European Business Connections, um, which helps Irish and German companies and organizations uh, connect and create business value together. That's that's how what it was set up for. Um, and I've been part of the this I've been part of the, the kind of German Irish bilateral trade relations for the best part of six years now. Um, I was basically the deputy CEO of the, the German Irish Chamber of Commerce, and uh, I was also the country manager for an organization organization called Bayern International. Um, and Bayern International is essentially the combination between Enterprise Ireland and the IDA combined. And Jochen Häusler, who unfortunately can't make it, he was actually the CEO of that organization. Um, and he started Big Wheel uh, that I'll briefly introduce uh, in, in, um, in a moment. Uh, and I'm also the country manager for Big, Big Wheel here in Ireland. Um, but as uh, John mentioned to you, uh, and just maybe to confuse you a little bit more, I'm actually also, uh, I have a number of different hats. Um, I'm also the director for Ireland of the social impact charity called Generation, um, which trains and places uh, 19 to 29 uh, year olds uh, into technology and customer support companies, um, about 40,000 actually globally at this stage. Uh, and funnily enough, we're actually globally partnered with, with Raise Microsoft, but also with the Verizon, BlackRock, McKinsey, uh, as well as Amazon, um, John, that you just mentioned there a, a moment ago. And perhaps uh, another time uh, I can speak about that a little bit more to, to you guys as a group with, um, with, with, with John. Um, it, John, can I just very quickly share just three slides? Would that be OK? Yeah, yeah. If not, no, sure. no worries at all. But just in case I can. Uh, I'll just I'll just do it. Bear with me. Uh, you let me know when I'm allowed in. Uh, if you can disable the, the the sharing screen again. If not, okay, perfect, guys. Good, yeah, that's, that's perfect. Yeah, that's perfect. So it's just three slides, guys. That uh, if I can just very briefly introduce. I think you have it here. So. Uh, I'm representing Big Wheel. Like again, Johan Häusler is the uh, is the CEO of it, um, and it's all about creating international business and, and success. And you know what Big Wheel actually stands for is bilateral innovation and investment growth. Um, and it, it, in many ways, it is a a, a multinational network um, that has been very very successful over the past number of years uh, in creating in creating business. So. Uh, uh, again, I mentioned the international bridging platform to co-create high impact economic success. So that's what it's all about. We very much focus on SMEs, uh, also institutions and working with experts um, uh, and creating that kind of national and, and, and international bilateral success stories uh, for regions and companies. Um, and uh, we've been doing this very successful for, for uh, a good number of years, also with Wine International. And uh, that's also where, 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 if you will, where Daniel commands, who I'll be introducing in a moment, um, because we've all worked very closely uh, together uh, in, in that. Um, I'm going to quickly see if I can just go or stop screen share there, if, if I may, and bring you, uh, and, uh, and bring you guys back. Um, so just in, um, in uh, in relation to uh, to to Daniel and, and Jochen, um, uh, we have worked together for again it's about four years, and we have projects here in Ireland as well as in Germany. Um, we have a lot of delegations that we've brought over from from Ireland to Germany. These are companies, multinationals, the academic, semi-states, you name it, uh, and it's very much about fostering um, cooperation, uh, but also sharing knowledge. Um, so it's been a lot about, you know, focusing on industry clusters, uh, centers of excellence, places exactly like what John has, which is which is uh, hubs again, centers of excellence like that. It's been very very exciting, um, and uh, the the it, it is about uh, those connections and creating partnerships um, and creating projects, which is which is very much key. Um, uh, Daniel, um, who we're going to be uh, hearing of now in a moment, um, he was the managing director um, of uh, Toom International, uh, and just very recently, I over the last week or two, um, has been uh, asked to be the managing director of Toom Campus in Heilbronn, and uh, he'll speak a little bit more about that in a moment. 
um, and I'm delighted to, have to, to, to be able to introduce you to them. Um, uh, we're going to have about, uh, about uh, you know, eight, eight or ten questions, that's, that, that's what we'll work at, and please put, your, put any questions you have in the chat box, uh, and I've asked John to kind of take notes of them, who will be asking um, uh, Daniel and myself uh, any questions that you have in a kind of Q&A, just a little bit at the end. Um, Daniel, if I can, if I can bring you in uh, at this stage, um, obviously we are focusing on, on uh, art, uh, artificial intelligence. Um, you know, what is the artificial intelligence hub at Toom Campus in Halbron? Uh, what is it all about? And if you can give us a, a bit of an introduction, not only to yourself but but to the to the to the campus. Yeah, thank you, Ronan. It will be my pleasure to do so, and thank you, John, for allowing me to to join the session. Um, I beg your pardon for the ugly background. I just moved <laughs> to that office two days ago, so I still need my bookshelf or something that makes me look more sophisticated. Uh, but <clears throat> yeah, uh, <clears throat> I'm the managing director of TOM campus in Heilbronn. This is the place where Technical University Munich gets Germany prepared for the digital age. So uh, it's, a new, it's a new type of a campus Traditional universities they are organized by faculties or departments, and they are all their little kingdoms uh, uh, defined by, by their own discipline. Here at this place, we bring together management, technology, and IT in order to build up an artificial intelligence hub with the main target groups, uh, family-owned businesses, because in that region here, we have a massive uh, uh, cluster of family-run uh, companies. Um, digital transformation and designing digital uh, solution systems, uh, both for public entities and also for companies. So at this campus, for instance, we will uh, set up an uh, energy clearinghouse for the whole of Germany to really calculate what would make sense in terms of hydrogen, in terms of fossil fuels, synthetic uh, fuels, and so on, how to bring that into a working system all of the AI that you need for it, all of the uh, um, uh, um, uh, system intelligence is something we do here at this campus. It is not allocated in Munich, it's allocated in the city of Heilbronn, which in Germany we would call it a medium-sized city, 120,000 inhabitants, and in China they would call it a village uh, probably. But uh, that is an important sign, I think, because uh, if you want to be a global hub in the digitalized age, you don't have to be a global hub in the traditional uh, sense. So this nice little uh, town, more or less, uh, within some uh, wine yards and at the river of uh, Mecca, uh, can be a global hub in digital terms. So that, in a nutshell, is what we are doing at the campus here. Fantastic. Thank you so much, indeed. Um, you know, we're going to talk a little bit about Industry 4.0. Um, you know, which is which is uh, you know key for, for for Germany and especially for, for Bavaria. And um, how do you think, Daniel, will Industry 4.0 um, contribute to a better life after COVID-19? Um, and this is so topical now, Daniel. Yeah. Uh, so I'm I'm among the few people who still think that uh, life after COVID-19 may be even more physical than, uh, than digital. I think we all share a similar experience. There are many, many things we can do via Zoom, via digital platforms, definitely more things than we thought that would work uh, before, but we are still human beings. We are not algorithms. So. Uh, 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 we need a type of physical uh, interaction. We will never have digitalized food. We want to go to a restaurant. We want to lay down on a real beach and not on a, on a um, uh, virtual beach. We have the phenomenon, at least in Germany, I don't know if it's the same case in, uh, in Ireland, uh, that government is pushing people very hard to um, uh, uh, stay at home and work from their home-based uh, office. But many people, they want to go into their office. I don't know whether you have the same thing in Ireland. Perhaps it's a very German uh, uh, thing. We want to have a clear separation between business life and private life. But of course, this is totally being mixed up by, uh, uh, by the effects of COVID-19. So in the future, I definitely think that we will have, driven by Industry 4.0, new job profiles. 
people will be much more flexible. They will rather work on projects instead of their one standard task. Much more people may have different employers instead of uh, like my father who was working for one company for 40 years uh, until he uh, went to pension. So that demands uh, uh, um, uh, to create new, uh, uh, new structures for people to live, to feel comfortable, uh, uh, because the old way, leaving the house in the morning, going to work, returning uh, 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 tiredly uh, in, the, in the evening, and then having your family life, this will be mixed up. New business opportunities, new ways. We will definitely um, see much, much more intelligence regarding global supply chain management. John, you have uh, mentioned that in your introducing uh, slides. Uh, nobody would have imagined how vulnerable our globalized uh, supply chain structure is. This big machine of globalization, how, how easy it is to turn the off button and, uh, and uh, um, uh, bring it down. If you would have asked me by the early March 2020, is it possible that Lufthansa may cut down its flight connections by 90%? I would have said, never will that happen. Even if it's World War III, it will not happen. And two weeks later, it happened. So um, making our global supply chains more intelligent, more resilient by a lot of applications, as John has mentioned, that are here already. They are not science fiction. They are broadly known and applied, but they are much more trusted after uh, COVID-19. So that is definitely um, uh, an important development. The other one I would like to mention is that the competitiveness of regions, of places, of cities, uh, um, uh, uh, will be changed because in that regard, COVID-19 and Industry 4.0 are tremendous game changers. We had, um, as TOM International, two years ago, we worked uh, in Ireland with Cork County. Uh, and, and together with, with Cork County, we started to develop a new uh, um, uh, uh, economic development strategy, how to support SME in Cork and uh, create new business clusters. And one thing we did was a network analysis. That is something you can do. You check all of the companies in the region. You analyze where are their connections, are they linked to other entities in other places, and you put that on a map to show the, the connectivity of a, uh, of a region or of a, of a city. And that was an amazing result. It showed that Cork was much more, much more intensively connected to global places than anybody would have thought. Uh, India, Russia, Hong Kong, wherever. So at the end, we called it a hidden network because Cork was not, and probably still is not really capitalizing that network. You don't see it. But um, uh, using that network, finding a way to, to, uh, to activate it, means that you can compete with a global hub like uh, Singapore, New York, uh, Shanghai, because as Cork, you can uh, have at least some of the benefits from uh, the benefits of a global hub because of your high level of connectivity without having the disadvantages of a global hub. Because if you have the lockdown in, uh, under Corona times, you would rather be somewhere uh, uh, in, an, in an Irish town where you can walk in the fields in 10 minutes instead of uh, in the 20th floor of a skyscraper in, in Shanghai city. So that means that in the future, competitiveness of regions, of cities will be changed. And uh, um, uh, that is true for Germany. I think it's also true for Ireland. It, uh, it's a really interesting point, Daniel, because we talk about uh, here we have the IDA and, you know, the IDA uh, at this moment of time is, is trying to figure out with these people not working from uh, from the offices, do they need to be, you know, situated in, in Ireland? And yes, when you look at something like Cork and we worked on this project together, we look at the quality of life. Um, and because especially Bavaria is, is more uh, decentralized, they have that quality of life. You can you can literally have your your multi as it happens, your multinational in in a very uh, regional area, uh, and it can very much work out. Um, and the other interesting thing I also about the, the, the Cork project was that um, you know Cork as being a link between Europe and and, uh, and the USA, uh, and that can also certainly continue, and not just that, but also but also Asia. And I want to ask you um, 
just uh, coming back to industry 4.0, what do you see are the key challenges um, for, for a business starting out on, on an industry 4.0 journey, it's, it's specifically when we, you know, when we look at the audience uh, of today, guys, yeah. Yeah, understand. So um, uh, some of these points have been mentioned by John at the beginning uh, 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 already. It's a very individual uh, journey. This is not a standard evolution, Industry 2.0, uh, uh, 3.0, uh, 4.0. Uh, the main challenge, like in any other areas, is understanding your own business, understanding your own processes. What do you want to achieve? Where do you want to go? Digitalization is a supporting um, uh, system. There are supportive tools. They will not replace your business strategy. They support it, they don't, uh, uh, don't replace it. We, we have a very interesting example here in Bavaria. We uh, created a competence center at the oldest industry park that we have in Bavaria. It's nearly 100 years old. Since 100 years, they are uh, producing chemical fibers at that place called Industry Center Obernburg, north of Bavaria, in a, in a very rural uh, place. The closest uh, um, uh, town has 9,000 inhabitants. So 100 years old, it's not fancy, it's not nice. It has shabby old brickstone uh, buildings. You don't want to show it to your delegations from, from Saudi Arabia or, or, or China. Uh, and some of the machines that they use for the chemical fibers production, they are from 1930 something. They are 90 years old or, or even older. Old machines, industry, industry um, uh, 1.0, 2.0. Not a lot of uh, robots being applied, not a lot of uh, automation. However, these old machines, they are now being uh, um, steered and controlled and uh, applied via an app on your iPhone or on your, on your iPad. Um, not because they broke down everything and invested uh, billions into factories of the future and not by running expensive, big, mighty software systems, but by applying a few sensors in a very, very smart way, connecting them and just applying that level of digitalization that you need to overcome critical bottlenecks and really push efficiency of your production. Three or four years ago, there was a fire at that place uh, um, where, they, where they produce the, the chemical fibers. And these machines are in the basement of the factory. So um, before they use these sensors, having a fire at one of these machines would have forced the operators to shut down all of the machines. The damage would have been probably hundreds uh, of millions of euro. By investing 200,000 euro into these sensors, they could run the machines even while the fire still was burning. Uh, that was amazing to see. So it's not about um, uh, uh, doing whatever you can to, to, to achieve the 4.0 label. It's about having a smart digitalization. That is a challenge because it, uh, um, it's not about shopping something. It's uh, understanding your own business and then telling people what type of solution you need. Without the right challenge statement, uh, you won't get the right digital tool. Really, really interesting that that point, and I, I know we uh, we actually visited uh, the that um, that industry park, uh, Daniel. Uh, and uh, would you believe for, for for the crack, as we say here, we actually had uh, Ambassador Michael Collins uh, there um, as a showcase of how you do not need a brand spanking new um, industrial park. Look what you can do with, with old and reinvent it. Uh, it was fascinating uh, for 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 Master Michael Collins to have to say it was it, it was it, it was super. So again, thank you for inviting us uh, there, Dan, at the time. Um, can I ask you just to describe the the Bavarian Industry 4.0 philosophy, Daniel? Um, if you can just give us a bit, a bit of background and, and depth on that. Yeah, so this philosophy uh, is very closely linked to the general industry structure and business structure in Bavaria. Bavaria has about one million companies. If you take away all of the one-man shows and restaurants and uh, so on, you still have uh, half a million uh, companies, small, medium-sized businesses, 90% of them are SME. Bavaria uh, has high-tech industry, it has very traditional industry, it even has a very strong farming and a very strong tourist uh, sector. So um, uh, uh, 
234.0 as being applied in Bavaria is not really linked to the few big powerful platforms. It's rather uh, being driven by group of smaller companies that identify their own targeted solution and apply it for their particular application. Farming 4.0, for instance. Some of our farming companies, Baiwa and others, they have teamed up and they um, uh, uh, apply drones to make sure that you use fertilizers in the optimized way and uh, um, uh, uh, other, other tools for, uh, for smart farming technologies. Same in the construction sector. So this is very much a, a bottom-up initiative by companies, mainly, mainly SME. That get together at the beginning, they don't care too much about the software or about the robots and how they will be interconnected. They care about their business and how they can make it smarter, more, uh, uh, more efficiently. Um, and then on the other hand, the Bavarian government provided platforms, supportive platforms for these companies. The biggest one is the Bavarian Center for Digitalization, which helps all of these companies, uh, as John uh, mentioned for his hub, to identify the right uh, solution, the right technology, but in particular, putting that together, creating, creating your tailor-made, your customized uh, system. And these companies are willing, not all of them, but, but uh, at least many of them are willing to sit together in a group, talk about their experiences, exchange experiences, grow, grow together. Um, that, is, uh, uh, that is, I think, a key uh, success factor of the Bavarian digitalization strategy. If you ask about e-government platforms in Bavaria, the big uh, um, uh, overall solutions, they are not so good. I mean, as a, somehow I'm a, I'm a representative of Bavaria, so I should tell you our, our Bavarian e-government is the best in the world, but at the end, it's, it's, it's not, it's really bad. It does not work. That may have to do a little bit uh, something with the Bavarian culture. We are, um, we are very strong individuals. We do not like to um, uh, fit into the, into the system. So bottom-up approach, very strong, decentralized approach, small and medium-sized companies that uh, drive it. Most of them are export-oriented, so they need to offer digital solutions for their customers all around the world, um, supported by cluster structures and uh, uh, Bavarian centers in a close alliance uh, with science, with universities, with campus projects. Um, but if you look for the one big Bavarian uh, uh, Industry 4.0 platform, you won't find it. If you find it, it won't be a good one. Really interesting. What do you think, Daniel, uh, what would have happened if, if Germany, or, or Bavaria in this case, didn't adopt Industry 4.0? Well, uh, the, uh, that question is hard to answer uh, because uh, actually, the industry 4.0, as we see it, is not something like a magical recipe that you apply and then you are safe and you and you uh, grow again. And if you don't apply it, you 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 fade away from from any type of disease. From my perspective, um, applying industry 4.0 in Bavaria is more or less what we already did since World War One or after World War Two, uh, because in Germany we have always been forced condemned more or less to optimize our efficiency in production as much as we can. Many people, no soil resources, high quality products, uh, um, a leading industry which is present on, on world markets. Uh, we can only be competitive with our products if our production is as efficient as it uh, only can be. And now that we have the opportunity uh, um, to, uh, to uh, apply digital tools to make our production even more efficient by stepping out uh, of your own boundaries, looking over the fence of your own factory and optimize the efficiency within one value chain or within one supply chain. We have to do it because it saves money, it makes our products cheaper. Uh, um, so if we wouldn't have uh, done that, uh, definitely uh, companies would uh, suffer even more from COVID-19 as they already do. But at the end, this is a question about keeping your market share, uh, uh, keeping competitive pricing of industrial products. 
certainly sounds it, it was a it was a mindset. Um, I have a question. What what is the the the, the what is next for German industry? You know, what is beyond industry 4.0? You know, where are you guys looking at it from that point of view? Yeah, I was expecting that question. So <laughs> just just uh, two hours ago, I asked our leading professor here at the campus, if they asked me what comes after industry uh, uh, 4.0, what should I answer? And of course he said, uh, tell them industry 5.0. But uh, that's not a that's not a trivial um, uh, uh, question. It's an uh, it's an important one. Today, you mainly have different intelligence interconnected uh, systems: M machines communicating with each other, machines communicating with your customer, uh, rather decentralized, uh, uh, many different systems. Industry 5.0 at least according to the scientists and the experts, and something that we already have in, in the B2C uh, world, is having larger platforms that would integrate or connect to all of these uh, uh, decentralized uh, uh, systems. That would be the next step. It works already quite well in, uh, in the uh, business to customer uh, world. If you have a look at your Google account and, and uh, what, it, what it can do, you already build up these platforms, but it doesn't really work yet in the B2B world, uh, connecting businesses. When we talk to robots producers in Malaysia, we, we had a project with KUKA. KUKA told us um, we could provide today a much, much better service to our uh, customers if they would share their production data with us. And this is safe, on a safe server, and it's neutralized, but still companies are not willing to, to um, automatically share this data with the producer of the robots. If they would do so, you would have a massive data uh, base and the artificial intelligence systems could optimize the function of these robots by far. But companies don't want to do that. I don't know how it is in your case, but whenever I get on my computer, uh, um, uh, alert, should I send an automatic report of this mistake to Apple or to, I always press the no button. I don't want my, my computer to send automatic, uh, automated reports. I don't know who will read it and uh, I say no. So there's a human factor and this human factor may of course influence the development of, uh, further development of digitalized systems. It's different in other countries. If you are in China, you don't care about uh, data protection or the human factor at all. You just get the data and put all of that into a big, uh, on a big government server. Uh, let, let's all pray that we won't have this uh, situation in, uh, in Europe. So if you ask me, I don't see that type of industry 5.0 development in the, um, in, the, in the B2B world. I rather think that the next step will be, um, yeah, as, as I said in the UK regarding Brexit, take back control. We will have something like that. If today you check uh, the new apps and the new software tools that work very well, uh, say these are all tools that help you to, to, to get control, to get power uh, in areas which needed uh, expensive experts before trading apps, for instance. Today, any school kid can trade complicated uh, finance products on the, on the stock market with a little app on the, on the uh, uh, iPhone. Five years ago, you would have had to hire an expensive uh, expert broker at a specialized bank to do so. It enables people to uh, uh, take part in a world that was closed for them before, and that's why it's successful, or, or clubhouse. You can talk to people you would never meet on the uh, on the floor. I think the same is true in particular for small and medium-sized companies. Whatever helps you as an entity to gain control, to create something on your own, to be the master of your own world, that will be successful wherever you have to take uh, to give away uh, power and control and you are linked to very big platforms. I think we will not see a very strong development into that uh, in, in that regard. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Daniel. On that, um, you know that the the cohort that we have here, we, we're very much focusing on a the, the if you will an Irish border region here. Now, what are there any concrete lessons learned that could help? I suppose us here, um, uh, you know, in, in this Irish border region. Just any any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think I think a few ones of of these examples I already mentioned. 
taxi one with the 100 years old industry uh, park. Don't don't uh, invest all of your money and, and push as hard as you can to get a, a industry 4.0 uh, stamp. Uh, um, uh, find a way to uh, implement your smart and own digitalization strategy. Don't apply for any standard. Create your own standard. All of the tools are there, and it's up to you to, to put it together. Uh, be brave, also as a region. My home region, where I was born, right in the middle of uh, Germany, uh, uh, that was 20 kilometers from the German-German border when I was a child. So from my uncle's window, I could see the guards at the border and see self-shooting machines. It was a horrible border. It was a border painted with blood. Uh, we were all afraid of it. And after the reunification, that border region turned quickly within a few years into a booming region of Germany, mainly driven by logistics companies. As you can imagine, poor peripheral region before, now all of a sudden you are at the heart of uh, Germany. I think that if we still would have the border, but with today's digitalization technology, some elements of that development would have taken place as well because there are opportunities in such a location. If you are able to deal with the border, if you are able to act as a, um, as a communicator and an organizer of trade flows, of uh, 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 information exchange, of gatekeeping as well, there are, this is a competence that you can use and that you can apply. And again, the Cork example, I think uh, at least to a certain extent, this is true for the Irish border region as well, um, you are definitely much more intensively connected than you know or than you would think of at the moment. Find intelligent ways to utilize, to capitalize these networks and have a strong appearance. Uh, um, I think that a, a digitalization cluster then for for Irish border region driven by small and medium sized companies, it can work perfectly. It could work in a cooperation with Bavarian uh, uh, partners. So don't, don't be too humble in that, uh, in that regard. Digitalization is an enabler for all of us. Fantastic. Uh, and and look, we look forward to possible um, cooperation between Bavaria and, and, uh, and the data value hub for sure. Just my last question before any questions and answers. Um, how should an Irish enterprise begin you know, this journey for them? Well, any, any thoughts on that? Any recommendations? Yeah, again, understand your own business. Define your business. Don't think of digitalization. Think of what you are doing and what you want to achieve. Uh, three or four years ago, we uh, set up a competence center for Industry 4.0 in Malaysia. It's, it's, it's uh, quite successful. It's a good uh, center called ACES. In the, in the Petronas Towers in, in uh, Kuala Lumpur. Uh, but it was hard for us to convince the Malaysian companies to apply this type of Industry 4.0 philosophy because um, whenever we came there with our group of experts and we met Malaysian industry representatives and talked to them, uh, our experts always said the same. Let's do an in-house workshop. Let's analyze your processes. Let's identify the bottlenecks. Let's double check it against your business strategy. And then let's define a roadmap and concrete measures for smart digitalization. And the Malaysian companies didn't want to, to, to hear that. They told us, we don't want to have consultancy. We want to buy industry 4.0. Give us a software, give us a machine, show, show us how it works, and then let's buy it and put it into our, into our factory. Of course, that's not the way it works. Uh, um, on the other hand, uh, the fact that you need this type of strategic implementation of an industry 4.0 strategy, of course, is a big business for consultants. And there are good consultants and bad, bad, uh, bad consultants. Uh, um, uh, so uh, that is why if you have something like, like uh, John's Digitalization Hub, use it. Keep these people busy. Let them visit your company, put together a tailor-made system with them, line up with other uh, um, companies, corporation partners. They may be from a different sector, so you may, you may not wish to share this experience with your direct competitor, but perhaps different companies may have similar challenges. Uh, uh, do that together. Don't spend too much money. Spend money in the right way, in a smart way. So that is a very, very uh, general statement, of course. But as John said at the beginning, it's always an individual uh, journey. 
Daniel, thank you so much indeed. Uh, John, in relation, I thought I saw a question from Eugene, and maybe you've questioned yourself, John, um, to, to, to wrap up this part of the, 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 the seminar. Well, um, if, yeah, if, if Eugene has a question, um, I let him go first, yeah? Eugene, I just saw you, you put it in the chat. Do you want to ask the question yourself, Eugene, maybe? Yeah, Ronan, Eugene Conlon here. My involvement is in the whole area of energy and particularly looking at the whole area of retrofit. So I work for a not-for-profit organization here. Your work, Ronan and Daniel, is important. And I, I earlier or over the last two years, we've had very successful relationships with the Renewable Energy Agency in Germany and indeed the, with the, I think it's the Humboldt Vianda Governance Platform. So that has been a very important relationship from our point of view that has actually helped our thinking considerably when it comes to issues around climate change. One question I have is, there's a challenge we're experiencing here in Ireland at the moment, and that is that the different levers that are required to address the challenges of climate change from generation to retrofit to actually just handling data from manufacturing from those involved in manufacturing, from those involved in homes. It's just managing a lot of those, the, the importance of recognizing the connectivity between those different levers around climate change. And I just wanted to get your thoughts about, you know, I, have you some experience or exposure to that area to know what, what, what we can do in that area of improving that connectivity? Daniel, if I can, if I can ask you to possibly answer that. Pardon, could you repeat? Uh, Daniel, do you want to answer that? Uh, yes. Of course, uh, that, 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 is, that is an uh, important point because it shows us the, um, the uh, uh, urgency of establishing systems that can handle complexity. We have that in many, many areas. We have the same topic as I, as I mentioned at the beginning, now uh, when we are setting up our energy uh, clearinghouse for Germany. It's the same question. You can have perfect solutions for each little sector, uh, but if you do not integrate it, if you don't have an AI platform that helps you to, uh, to manage the, uh, the overall uh, um, uh, system, then this will not work. And we have bad experiences in that regard with the German uh, e-mobility mobility strategy. Each city, each little town has its own e-mobility standard and system. Uh, if you don't connect it, if you don't connect it to a smart city uh, standard, it will not work. China has one ministry and does it for the whole uh, country where it's getting implemented. If we talk about renew uh, renewable energies, we need something like a virtual power plant or a network of virtual power plants across Germany. If we talk about hydrogen uh, um, uh, as an energy carrier, we need to connect it to the existing uh, pipeline infrastructure. Some of these pipelines will also continue to carry fossil energy carriers, crude oil, at least for the next 10 or 20 years, because we cannot turn this down completely from one day to the other. But within this transition period, maybe five years, 10 years, 20 years, we will uh, consume less and less crude oil and we have to um, uh, use it in a much more efficient way. Use it only for these petrochemical processes where you still need it. Um, yeah. And all of that has to be calculated. You need an optimization formula uh, for that. You can only do that with big data. We need uh, uh, gigantic uh, um, uh, uh, power for that, artificial intelligence power. And we need to do that not only on a national level, we need to do it on, on a European level. So it's an it's a, a still unsolved challenge. No, no matter whether at the end you apply this optimization algorithm for climate change or for energy security or, or for whatever. At the end, it's the same optimization uh, strategy. The more we can work together in that regard, build up strong and powerful systems, the, the, the better it is. Thank you so much indeed. John, I'll leave it up to, to or hand over to you if there's any other questions. Yeah, no, no, that, that, that's, it, it's, um, it's fascinating to get the insight, uh, Daniel and Ronan, from, uh, from Germany, from Bavaria in particular, where 
the concepts around Industry 4.0 began. Um, and then, you know, I, I think I think the flow of questions that you've covered there, Ronan and uh, and Eugene, it covers a huge swathe. There's no other question that that immediately jumps to mind. Um, yeah, you've you've touched on it. I, I guess my, my only thought then is, does anyone else have a question before we move on to the next section? Anyone on the line have another question? Mm, for John, just in in, in, clo in in closing, you know, okay. we are very. Uh, very keen to work with with you, John, and, and all your members and your network. Um, if you want to, you know, cooperate. If you want to look for for, for companies uh, that you would like to work with in in Bavaria, um, you know, in Bavaria, uh, but also in Baden Württemberg, where Daniel's um, new campus is, there is a myriad of of of, of industry clusters and centers of excellence. Um, and when we talk about European funding and, and things like that, there's going to be a, a lot of opportunities in future. And I look forward to, to working with you, John, and your cohort. Uh, and we're very much open um, to, to, to inviting you over uh, and to inviting you know, groups of, of, of uh, you know, companies and organizations over for sure. So thank you very much indeed on our side. And Daniel, thank you so much indeed for taking the time to, to, to yes. present and uh, speak this year. There's one question that's come in from uh, Ronan McGrain, which is um, around the size of the business. So Ro Ronan's question is very interesting. You know, what, what sort of minimum size? Is it a case of, you know, a business with a million euro turnover is the smallest size to start thinking about, uh, about this? So where, where, you know, on that scale of small to medium to large where i guess your your question ronan is really where where, where does it kick in where, where does it and you, you touched a little bit on it earlier daniel but maybe think if you could talk a little bit more about that for, for businesses that are thinking about this what sort of minimum size are they typically at yeah so an, an industry 4.0 consultant would tell you no matter what size no matter how big you or small you are uh, give me a consultancy contract and uh, industry 4.0 will help you so of course that depends very much on what your company i don't think it depends so much on the size that you have right now but it may depend on your growth uh, strategy we are working with a company in poland uh, for instance producing certain type of, of pipes for for uh, for buildings, pipes for water and, uh, and cooling media, and they have an annual turnover of 2 million euro. They are a small company, and uh, it's a semi-automized uh, production. Most of that is handmade in, uh, in, in Poland. And that company now is investing, not a lot, but it's Poland, they get a lot of European funding, but they are investing into uh, an app and in, an integration software to directly communicate with architects, planners, and uh, developers, for instance, of combined heat and power stations. That will allow them to massively expand their business. They become a just-in-time supplier to construction sites, and their plan is to um, uh, uh, grow and uh, expand uh, by a factor 10 within the next five years by applying that software. So if you take the investment, I don't have the, the, the numbers in place, but uh, an investment of, of uh, four or 500,000 euros that they have to invest, it's definitely worth because it's complete, it's, it enables them to realize their growth strategy. If you say, I'm a small company, everything works well, that I'm, I don't want to grow, I don't want to see, ma I don't see major threats, never change a running system. You don't have a, a reason to, uh, to uh, change everything to the digital world. Keep in mind, however, that in some businesses, you need certain, you need to meet certain standards, you need to get certain uh, certificates or whatsoever, which in the future may demand a certain digitalization level. So um, uh, uh, again, a general, um, uh, a general uh, uh, answer. But if you have a growth strategy for your business in mind, see how digitalization can help you to support it. If you have bottlenecks today, uh, that could be, could be overcome. It's just a business decision. How much does it cost me to implement digitalization solutions? And can somebody show me the return on that investment? And there are even companies 
that do not uh, don't get paid by uh, by by selling you a software or a robot they they get paid by the by a certain share of the uh, savings that they produce with that industry 4.0 um, uh, uh, solution so these may be options for smaller companies who uh, uh, say i don't want to invest too much but if it creates uh, if it allows me to reduce my production costs then uh, it's worth trying mm -hmm. Thanks, Daniel. Thank you very much. John, you have my uh, contact data. Please feel free to share it with anybody who would like to get in touch. You are uh, uh, all very welcome at our campus in Heilbronn, at least once traveling is, uh, is possible again. And uh, wherever, John, we can connect Data Value Hub and CTUM campus here, we are more than happy to do so. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Daniel. And thank you, Ronan, also. So we'll... we'll um... We'll jump back to the agenda. Uh, we're, we started late, so we're running a little late, but um, the, our next, uh, our next uh, speaker is uh, Yasin, and Yasin is from the um, CEDAR uh, organization, the National Center for Applied Data Analytics. So Yasin, will I do you want to um, present? Will I, will I stop sharing? Yeah. You can share, okay. Yeah, thank you. So uh, hi everyone. Uh, so it's a pleasure to be here uh, this afternoon to share with you uh, and to introduce you to the CIDAR Center, to our activities, and also to some of the exciting AI project uh, we are working on. So I have a few slides that I will share. Uh, uh, <clears throat> do you see my screen? See. Okay, so uh, so my name is uh, Yassine Julasi. I'm uh, the senior commercialization manager for the CIDAR Center. Uh, so CIDAR is the National Center for Applied AI in Ireland. Uh, and our mission is uh, to help companies deploy uh, AI technology in order to improve their competitiveness. So what we do is uh, we reduce all the barriers for AI innovation. So uh, just maybe quickly about the agenda that I skipped. So I, I'm going to introduce uh, the CIDAR Center, our expertise, how we help companies uh, deploy AI technologies and uh, connect that to their uh, competitive advantage and business uh, uh, KPIs. Uh, and then I'm, uh, I'm going to share with you some of the uh, projects that we have been working on and that some of them also are uh, still uh, running uh, on how AI uh, was able to, let's say, transform uh, uh, the business and manufacturing. And I hope some of those projects will resonate with, uh, uh, with uh, your challenges as well. So back to uh, CIDAR. Uh, so uh, we are funded by Enterprise Ireland and uh, IDA, and we are part of uh, UCD and uh, TU Dublin. Uh, just a few maybe accreditation that we recently had. Uh, so CIDAR is a digital innovation hub for AI in Ireland. So there is 30 uh, digital innovation hub in, uh, in AI in Europe and uh, we are the one in Ireland. And this is um, a European uh, initiative from the European Commission to drive uh, and accelerate the digital transformation and the AI transformation for the European ecosystem and for the Irish uh, ecosystem. And uh, we have been also uh, awarded the iSpace Gold Award from the Big Data Value uh, Association, which is the main association for uh, AI and data analytics uh, companies uh, in Europe. And this shows like the expertise and the impact that we were able to have uh, in the Irish ecosystem and also at the European uh, level. So uh, CIDAR is what we call uh, a uh, Applied AI Technology Center, uh, which means that all what we do is actually to uh, is driven by industry needs and industry challenges. Uh, so we have uh, we are one stop shop for AI innovation and applied uh, research and development in AI, and all the solution that we deliver are directly connected to the uh, business KPIs and to a key competitive advantage for for companies. Uh, we have around. Uh, 92 industry members and they span across all uh, sort of uh, sectors which also show the uh, like the wide span of impact that AI is having in, in different sectors, like even the ones that you think are not digitalized at, at all, like uh, you, you start to see a lot of impact that AI is having uh, on some of the companies. 
So uh, CEDAR is playing the role of uh, a bridge between uh, pure academics and the commercial world. So we, we don't do uh, uh, like pure research, but we leverage all the expertise and excellent academic research to bring something uh, uh, that could be commercialized and that uh, can bring a key competitive advantage for companies. Uh, and so we, are, we operate very close to market. So our expertise uh, span across all sorts of area of AI, uh, all the buzzwords that you might hear, machine learning, deep learning, uh, explainable AI is also a very hot area right now. Uh, blockchain, we have also expertise uh, on blockchain. So the way we operate is actually to always start to be ahead of the curve in terms of AI expertise. So whenever there is new emerging AI uh, technology, we try to build capacity before then, uh, before the companies start asking to deploy those uh, uh, type of technologies. Uh, so the, how we help uh, companies, uh, and I think uh, this came a lot of uh, across the, the dis dis discussion uh, this afternoon. So the first step is always uh, an, is to do an assessment for the companies and to assess their readiness in terms uh, of how, like, where do they sit, let's say, from a scale from one to five, what's their AI readiness uh, across all the enabling dimension of AI that could be like, let's say the main one will be, will be data because data is the fuel for any uh, project. So once we understand where the companies sit uh, and in their AI journey, then we help them. We understand their ambition and then we help them and we guide them to uh, move on to the next level. And that could be done through uh, delivering training or building the first POC for them and then scale it to uh, uh, maybe a bigger or larger scale uh, project and put it in production. And it can all, uh, we also offer like, let's say funding, uh, opportunities like what will be the best funding mechanism to de risk uh, those projects because a lot of AI pro like the difference between maybe AI project and other IT project is like an AI you won't be able to let's say uh, guarantee that you that's the value that you'll be getting because that will depend on, from a lot of, uh, of parameters and one of the most para important parameters is the data so you'll have like the quality of your AI product will be as good as the data that you use to to build the product. So the risk in those projects and uh, uh, starting with POCs is a great way to uh, build momentum in the company and to demystify all the uh, aspect around AI and then uh, let's say uh, move on to the next level in terms of AI uh, maturity. So we, we help company uh, in terms of AI strategy roadmap. Uh, we build POCs, a bespoke AI solution for them. We run workshops, so a large part of what we do is to run workshop, try to understand the company uh, challenges, what's their ambition, and then bring the AI technology that best fit and to, uh, or to tackle that type of challenges. We collaborate with a lot of companies uh, and uh, among like a lot of consortium at European and the national level. Uh, so there is a lot of funding opportunities, either at national level like DTIF or uh, through European uh, funding framework and uh, like Horizon Europe and Horizon 2020. Uh, and uh, we also offer training and uh, placement opportunities for companies. Uh, so uh, here is some of the key uh, strategic uh, consortium at the European level that are related to uh, where we are involved and that are related to uh, manufacturing. So uh, EnterQ is uh, one of them, which is about uh, uh, zero defect, creating zero defect manufacturing, uh, let's say ecosystem uh, in Europe. And we have also DIH World, uh, which is about advancing digital technologies for European uh, manufacturing companies. So there is a lot of, uh, let's say, uh, investment uh, that came and that is coming through the next uh, digital, uh, Horizon uh, Europe uh, framework to help companies start or accelerate their digital transformation, and their, their AI transformation, because AI is come hand on hand with digitalization and have a lot of, in a lot of aspect of digitalization. So now I'm gonna move on to, uh, and to give you a taster uh, of some of the CIDAR uh, project uh, that we have with uh, industry, uh, with our industry partners. Uh, so the first, and I hope like some of those maybe project will resonate with uh, some of your challenges or some of the project that you have already. Uh, so the first one is uh, in the oil and gas industry uh, with a company in Scotland. 
So they have uh, large assets of uh, submersible uh, oil, uh, oil and gas pumps, and we help them to build a pre preventive maintenance uh, model. So uh, as you can imagine, there is a huge opportunity cost to have a, a pump, an oil and gas pump, uh, shut down for one day or two days. Like it's a huge cost for, uh, for a production company. So, and they were generating a lot of data, IoT data from uh, all the, the, those assets. So we uh, helped them to, let's say, digest all that data, analyze it, and then build a model to be able to predict in advance when a pump will be, uh, uh, will fail. And then, so they can be able to intervene ahead of time to prevent uh, the pump, uh, the failure of the pump. So uh, the other uh, project, uh, it's on inspection robots uh, with the uh, aeronautical, aeronautical uh, company in aviation. Uh, so uh, it's a, a based on computer vision. So computer vision is also like very uh, key uh, technology in the manufacturing uh, context because like it, it help you to let's say detect fa uh, uh, faulty uh, or let's say cracks in, in the framework. So in this project, we. Uh, like the company had the robot and then we built the AI model to be able to kind of create a digital twin for, for the framework of the aircraft and be able with computer vision to detect cracks in area that are maybe very difficult to access uh, from agents. Uh, and that like increases safety, of course, like for, for the aircraft and prevent any uh, like major issues and also like safety of the people that are intervening in the maintenance. Uh, uh, aspect. Uh, another uh, pro uh, <coughs> project uh, on AI and uh, for uh, like manufacturing context, uh, again using computer vision uh, for inspect for uh, quality assurance. So to inspect uh, the quality of uh, of product as it's being uh, produced in the product line, and again it's part of let's say building the digital twin of uh, of uh, of the whole process, being able to connect all the processes and all the IoT data that you are getting from your production line and relate that back to the quality of the product that you are producing and everything is done automatically. You are able to use the camera and the computer vision model to be able to detect a faulty or non-conform product. Another uh, project that is uh, currently running, uh, and we have uh, we are, were inspired by a uh, uh, project from Google called DeepMind. So Google, a uh, few months ago, was able to reduce uh, the electricity bill of one of their data centers by uh, forty percent using uh, a model called uh, reinforcement learning. Uh, and so what we did is we built uh, a prototype to uh, like and we test different type of algorithms and let's say in smaller and smaller scale. And we're actually looking for partners to be able to, uh, let's say scale that and maybe in a manufacturing or a bigger scale uh, project. So, uh, and this is like the way also we try to be ahead of the curve in terms of expertise. So this is a new area and uh, sustainability is, is a hot area and it's becoming a key uh, focus for a lot of companies and this is, uh, this project will help them transform and reduce uh, their uh, become, let's say, carbon neutral. Uh, uh, so this is an, another project uh, with uh, SAC electricity. Uh, so this project had uh, two uh, main aspects. The first one, again, like it's in preventive maintenance, uh, like digesting all the data they were getting from their uh, wind farm uh, through the IoTs and then being able to uh, predict the failure of, uh, of, of those uh, wind turbine. Uh, so this is the first uh, aspect. The second aspect was to uh, leverage uh, multiple stream of data. Uh, so the process of the uh, wind turbine plus uh, uh, <coughs> weather forecast to be able to predict uh, in advance uh, the production uh, for, uh, for uh, of electricity, uh, which is very critical and the electricity market where they have to commit an, uh, to a certain amount of production and they, they have to pay penalty if they're not able to achieve uh, those commitments. So this uh, project on the green energy side. Uh, and another uh, 
hot area that maybe is not directly related to uh, manufacturing, but might be related to maybe companies operating in the food industry, manufacturing food industry, uh, using uh, earth observation. So there is a huge push from at European and also uh, from the Irish government to leverage the wealth of data that is generating, uh, being generated every day from uh, the constellation of satellite uh, uh, from the Copernicus uh, uh, services. So there is a lot of data and there is a lot of, let's say, potential for, for innovation, for leverage that data uh, to, let's say, to, to bring value to, uh, to companies. So maybe one of, one of the project is about predicting the output of um, uh, forest, uh, let's say, uh, like the yield of a certain crop. So classifying the crop and then being able to, to predict based, let's say, on the behavior of, or like on the uh, satellite images and the behavior of the crop throughout, let's say, the past three months, being able to predict the yield, uh, like, in advance and to be able to predict the supply. So this is one, uh, <clears throat> uh, one project, another pro uh, project that we, uh, it's a prototype that we built. It's about identifying again through uh, satellite data, uh, let's say uh, food damages, being able to, pre to see, uh, detect uh, buildings or even cars and uh, which will help, let's say insurance company to uh, assess the damage from any major uh, problem uh, at scale without having to, let's say, send an agent uh, each time just to assess the, the damages. Uh, and another uh, <coughs> area where we are very active, uh, I think it came in one of the conversations today, is uh, using drones and UAV uh, to, uh, again, like to, to, to uh, <coughs> to see or to, to map uh, uh, the, the quality of the crop and maybe to help, for example, uh, agriculture into optimizing uh, their water usage or the fert fertilizer, fert fertilizers uh, usage using the UAVs, uh, drones, uh, satellite data could be also like it's a multiple stream of uh, data that we are conversion into one model to be able to predict uh, accurately and help uh, help uh, uh, agriculture to to optimize their their process so and then in a nutshell uh, what i could uh, do for you is obviously automation uh, for example automating uh, the quality assurance process that we uh, have seen in one of the use cases uh, it could opti optimize the efficiency of uh, your processes uh, and that's uh, for example, the, the example of the <coughs> Google uh, DeepMind uh, algorithm that was able to reduce, like to find the sweet spot to be, and of how to operate the whole data center in order to be able to reduce their electricity bill by 40%. Uh, and then enhancement of the ability of individuals uh, and like in any manufacturing uh, company, like there is a huge amount of data that is being generated from uh, IOTs and uh, I think it's like the human brain is constrained to be able to digest all the data and analyze it. So AI could find patterns into the data and then build a diagnostic uh, or preventive maintenance uh, uh, models. And in a, let's say zooming into the manufacturing setting. So uh, AI could help you on optimization and best quality. So optimize system operations for best performance and efficiency. Uh, monitoring, uh, detecting anomalies uh, into your production line, diagnosis and do a root cause analysis for, let's say, certain failure why, why this happened so we can prevent it from happening again. And the big area is the preventive maintenance, be able to predict from the data that is being generated if, uh, if uh, the likelihood of, of certain equipment to, to fail. So this is a nutshell, maybe how, like, the AI capability could be uh, impacting the manufacturing uh, sector. And thank you very much for your attention. So I'll be happy to take any question you have. Thanks. I, think I was quite fast. <laughs> yeah, no, no, that, that's excellent. No, you, you, you covered a lot of ground. Um, Sorry, uh, stop sharing. 
And um, I wonder, does anyone have any questions for Yassine? Okay, so I suppose a question that, that I have, Yassine, is around, um, yeah, the engagement model. So if a business wants to engage with Cedar, what, what we as the hub would help make that happen. Mm. But um, have, you, have you done much in the food sector? It's a in, in our region we have uh, we have a big food sector. We also have a, a very uh, well established um, construction sector and uh, manufacturing pro manufacturing products into construction. So when I when I think of who's on our call and the 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 kinds of businesses um, that they represent, you know construction, uh, you know in, in in various different aspects food in, in other aspects. Um, um, and then there's a, there's a couple of other niche players as well on the call. But if you take food, just take food, for example, have you done much with food manufacturing businesses in Ireland? Yeah, so uh, actually one of the projects that I show about uh, using computer vision to detect, uh, let's say, uh, yeah. non conform product was in the food sector. So we, uh, we have a few projects in the food sectors and uh, it's actually, we are now seeing, we have ongoing opportunities now in the food sector to help companies build a digital twin, uh, leverage their data to build digital twins. So that's an uh, area uh, that, we are, uh, that we have expertise in and we are also building. And construction, so uh, unfortunately we did not have a, a past project on construction, but again, like our expertise across different verticals is able, to, like we are able to, uh, uh, let's say transfer that to uh, any other uh, uh, vertical uh, as long as there is data. So uh, our engagement process usually is start with running a series of workshop with companies to understand their context, their companies, their challenges, their strategy, uh, assess their AI readiness, so ask questions about their data, their IT infrastructure, maybe the talents, uh, do they have uh, already an AI in-house uh, um, let's say team, or are they uh, willing like to leverage like uh, let's say uh, our expertise? So it's assessing the company, understanding their ambition, and then uh, most importantly also understanding the, their domain. And then based on that, we'll uh, bring our expertise, uh, our expertise to bring what will be the best AI technology that best will help them to solve those challenges. So usually it's around two or three. Uh, workshop to uh, scope a project, an AI project. And then based on that, it's like company either want to uh, fund it 100% or leverage uh, some of the national funding that are accessible. And in both cases, we help them. So if it's uh, through funding, uh, like national funding, we help them to write, uh, we write the proposal for them. And then like it's some collaboration, but let's say yeah. we take the bulk, uh, biggest part of, of the writing. And, and then once it's granted, then it's a collaborative work. So it's our, uh, data scientist team that develop the project, but we all always have focal point in the company. So to, we'll have, let's say, bi-weekly or weekly uh, meeting just to make sure that we are heading into, into the right direction, that we are developing something that is valuable for the company. Very good. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, see, that's a yeah, good, in, yeah. good um, overview. Um, hey, David. Yeah, yeah. Are, there, are there any other questions or do, should we move on? Uh, I think David. Uh, is, David wants to ask John, a question. I, David, John, if I could ask a question. One of the how you saying greetings. Um, one of the things that intrigues me is the. Uh, I mean, there are some uh, companies in the um, what I would call a sort of high value added molecule sector, uh, looking at proteins and enzymes uh, as a way of working with foods. Two issues that uh, we are looking at here at BioConnector. One. Um, what we would refer to as waste valorization. So how can you use um, technology, essentially biotechnology to uh, assist with either increasing the value of the waste or recycling it into something of higher value? And the second one is looking at um, using machine learning and, and AI to identify uh, proteins that have potential either therapeutic, veterinary, human, uh, or um, or other activity. Um, 
for example, they could be used to um, break down certain components. They could be used to change the structure of certain things, sugars, etc. Um, do you have any projects of that nature or any expertise in that space? Uh, unfortunately, no. I think like, like in this particular niche, uh, like as far as I know, uh, I can double check maybe with our uh, some of our technical team just to see if they might have maybe uh, that expertise and uh, previous experience, but as, a, as far as I know, uh, we don't have the expertise in that, uh, in that area. But in waste management, so maybe the use case that come, come to my mind is helping into, uh, let's say, identifying different type of, uh, of waste, for example, using computer vision and then helping to uh, directing those different stream of waste to different, uh, uh, like, part, but I don't know, like in the, uh, being able to, let's say, convert certain type to, of waste to a high value uh, product. Uh, it's, uh, I think it's not part of our expertise uh, as far as I Okay. Know. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, David. Um, thanks, Yassine. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll move on to the, to the next section, which is um, with Ray. Mulligan from Microsoft and Ray wants to will talk about um, Microsoft's perspective on um, on artificial intelligence. So Ray, I'll hand over to you. You probably want to present your slides. So let me just yeah. stop sharing. Sure. You can share. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, let me know when you can see that coming through. You should be seeing it now. Can see it. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thanks. Thanks. Um, thanks, John, for having me here. And uh, great to listen to some of the other speakers there. So I was I was very happy to be asked, con considering my background is 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 very close to the areas of we were talking about I'm a McCavan man. Um and uh, you know, brought up on a farm and farming background and uh, mushroom production as well. So a lot of it went towards Mona. And so I've a good interest and, and uh, of, of the area. So what I'm specifically going to talk about today is is really uh, um, artificial intelligence and market in, in manufacturing and uh, you know how you can use that to accelerate innovation and and and, and revenue and grow deeper insights um, with increased in, in efficiency. And it's going to kind of follow on from Yassine was saying, I think it's tied fairly closely with, with the with the pillars he was talking about. So hopefully it should make a bit of sense. Um, let me just click through here. So some of the trends that we're seeing um, across the market and across across the industry is, uh, you know, there's there's sixty percent by twenty twenty two. We'll see a sixty percent shift across the um, smart factory and technology to to process change management. Uh, Ten percent of opex through digital twins. Um, smart factories driving, you know. <laughs> 344 billion in, in value by 2023. So we're seeing a lot of massive changes around artificial intelligence and how it's going to uh, how it's going to impact businesses over the next the next number of years. Um, I'm not going to go through all of these in the interest of time. I'll probably flick through some of these, but you know I'll I'll share the slides with John after, and uh, we can we can distribute them out, and anybody can reach out to me um, uh, for any further questions or whatever. So. Our support in manufacturers is deeply rooted across three kind of priority areas that we can see here on the screen. Um, it's, it's all about um, building more agile factories, you know, creating safe and secure agile factories for the future with um, IoT, with industrial IoT. Um, ultimately, we want to connect uh, and monitor factory performance across the globe, um, sort of using data for smart access to apply operational insights. And, and also, obviously, optimize the production processes. Um, also with, we want to create more resilient supply chains um, and an, improve, the, improve that uh, service resilience and profitability through the, 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 the intelligence supply chain, I suppose, management and, and also in the execution of it. Um, but also we want to supply, we want to transform the workforce. Um, we want to combine the, the productivity apps that we have in, within the market, um, but also with, with, with our intelligent 
cloud services and um, and transform the way people work um, to make it to make it safer and and more productive as well. Um, so here are some of the scenarios that we'll I'll break into and I'll go into a little bit more and there's some case studies, um, a couple of case studies that I'll probably fly through and a few of them are across what we talked about food, food production, but also construction industry as well. Um, and again, we'll, I'll leave the slides later that you can dig into in more detail. Um, so we'll, we'll initially dig into a little bit more about um, agile factories uh, in manufacturing, you know, how we do predictive maintenance and automated quality control. Um, so initially predictive maintenance for so some of the trends across predictive maintenance that we're seeing is, you know, 50 billion in, in annual cost of industry is, is is uh, is is a basically an unplanned downtime, and we can all we can all know that you know that is a is a big issue across businesses as well. Um, Daniel mentioned that about that earlier on, but you want to make sure that uptime is is increased, and and it's it's very important. Um, so AI implementations that target maintenance of machinery and product assets, you know, it's going to be up by twenty nine percent. And hundreds of millions of things will be represented by digital twins. Digital twins is, is growing hugely um, and will, will continue to grow over the next few, next few years. So some of the, some of the ways that we, we work around these is in predictive maintenance. Um, AI makes visible uh, both known and unknown maintenance patterns and enable early stage intervention. So allows issues to be addressed before they can escalate. Um, hopefully to, to results and hopefully they don't result in a costly downtime. So some of the solutions that you can use around that is, you know, machine learning for predictive maintenance, um, predictive maintenance modeling and detect uh, anomalous and uh, maintenance patterns seem, you know, seemingly in real time and then conduct exploratory analysis, analysis on the maintenance patterns. And some of the outcomes that you will see out of that is, way more proactive maintenance um your your downtime is is reduced um drastically um uh, but also you can uh, allow the you know spend spend more time later addressing uh, understanding where issues have come from um uh, but you know keeping keeping the uptime as uh, as as high as possible um improve visibility and insight across your manufacturing um also with operations and 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 more informed decision making um and also you can improve the uh, overall equipment equipment efficiency and the plant performance and the productivity so it's it's fairly important we've seen lots of customers using this one of them in in kind of food production is is Bueller um and some of the, the details that we see around those is um, they, had, they uh, created a, um, they had a solution around Azure AI um, with a variety of different products within, within the tool chain and within the platform that we have. Um, and they, uh, they enab enable manufacturers to predict the yield, the milling yield of, of a crop of corn by a single kernel. Um, and I'll, I can, like I said, I can share the, the actual case studies. These are all public case studies and there's a lot of detail around these are Switzerland guys. So obviously if you can do that, you're going to have massive impact. You can monitor the performance and generate more accurate record uh, records for, for each product batch. Um, so it's, it, it becomes hugely beneficial to be able to gain that insight and, and grow with it. Um, so next we, we'll dig into a little bit more of um, automated quality inspection. I, and I appreciate I'm, I'm kind of jump flying through these because um, it's getting late in the afternoon and I'll probably lose interest at this point. But again, reach out to me at some point if, you, if there's any more detail that you want to get through John, I suppose we can, we can work together. Um, so automated quality inspection, it'll address a lot of skill gaps with intelligent pro, uh, robotic processes um, by 2023. So these, you know, these, these numbers are probably escalating a lot more because of uh, people not being able to be on the ground as, as much as they were before the, before COVID hit. Um, machine learning will improve product quality in discrete manufacturing industries by 35% uh, and reduce 
you know, reduced plant overall, overall um, it, reduction in plant over, overall product productivity because of poor maintenance. That's, you know, it's, it's reducing on that as well. Then the interesting thing for me, and I think actually, um, I think it was John mentioned it as well, by 2025, 71% of tasks will be completed by machines up from 29% at the moment, which is, which is well, it was 29% last year. That's, we're probably well up on that already. Um, so, uh, you know, some of the things that you can do around this is, is using computer vision um, to automate uh, quality, uh, the QA process, uh, integrate optical, optical inspection and electronic components to identify and discard faulty parts early in the assembly line and then speed up the manufacturing out of that. Um, so, and like I say, some of the, the solutions that are there are around um, uh, the assembly of in real time. So uh, at a point of manufacturing on the assembly line in real time and, and you know, in the IoT enabled edge, we're doing an awful lot of work now at the edge rather than um, in the cloud. In the early stages of IoT devices, everything was sent to the cloud and all the crunching was done in the cloud, which is, which is good and it's a, it's a very useful way of doing it. But we're seeing a lot more customers doing a lot of work at the edge so that you're, it's, it's much more real time. Um, so you're not having to be restricted by bandwidth uh, on pushing information to the cloud. Um, and you know, there's there's loads of different components that we can do around that. Uh, but it's you, then you get real time, and uh, you can still push your data to the cloud to do to do further crunching later on. But the outcomes out of that is is fairly vast. You know, assured quality is standard practice up from an end to end uh, from the end to end on the assembly line, um, and the quality of product is is always assured even before the product leaves the factory. So you know, customers are happier. Um, and you can ensure future business and, and, and kind of reinforce positivity in your brand. Um, primal, uh, um, per, uh, Pyramid Glass is, is one of the, a good example there. They are analyzing, you know, 200 data points, um, leaving, leveraging IoT at the edge as well, but also pushing that through IoT Hub, which which basically allows them to allows them to control and manage their devices um, all within a single plane, which is which is hugely beneficial. Um, and you know the, the the data that they're taking about out of that is is giving them real time manufacturing insights. So really useful. So. We jump into the second scenario, um, more resilient supply chains. Um, again, some of the some of the components around here, and these are all these are all taken from resources like um, the light operations, cognitive supply chains, and all that kind of stuff. So they're they're all re re reputable data. Um, so some of the components here, supply chain leaders uh, who say their supply chain is facing more frequent and impact of business, or seventy percent of that, it's it's huge. I'm not going to read all of these in the interest of time, but again, they're on the recording, and we can look back at them later. But I can also share more in, more insights. I can share the resources that we have actually that we've we've achieved these from. So why why would you use AI? in supply chain optimization. Well, you kind of want to deliver end-to-end -end visibility into the supply chain logistics with IoT and also prevent the supply chain disruptions. You can mute, muted myself there. Um, you know, with machine learning and then accurately forecast customer needs and demands with warehouse and, inv um, and inventory to optimize the supply chain. Um, you know some of the outcomes out of out of that is you're gonna you're gonna enhance the product and and your service delivery with advanced insight and analytics that optimize planning and improve fulfillment and, uh, and material sourcing and logistics for the for the entire supply chain. Um, there's 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 endless amount of different capabilities that you could use to build these solutions. Um, some of them being maybe the data lake components and and um, some of the data ingestion 
uh, data we are in data factory but also synapse and and I'll, I'll, I'm not going to you know go down the route of mentioning all the products that we have but you know it's a it's a vast area that we can that is worth looking into um Kotachi was one of the ones that they I that I pulled in for for a case study as well um they really is is really interesting uh, again this is one that you can read and and you can see it on screen but it's 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 about enabling new opportunities and truly innovative products and services that customers need and that create new revenue streams so there's the customers are using AI in manufacturing for such broad broad range of technology broad range of of uh, uses um, and you know you can see these across the multiple case studies that we have so how do you transform the workforce which is which is you know it's fairly it's very important obviously um, worker health and safety is 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 very important um, and uh, you'll see it in the case study we do earlier that I talk about later on um, you know 70 percent of a tech a technician's time that can be non-range time. Uh, workers who say it's important to maintain flexibility in work schedule, and you know that's even more important now than it than it than it has ever been. 20% 20, 20 of manufacturing companies treat their assets as internal customers, reducing asset downtime by by 74%. These are all really important trends that we're seeing across the businesses, and, and these are going to grow, you know, over the next few years as well. So worker safety is very important in the factory floor, of, of course. Um, you need to combine the power of IoT sensors and AI to get the end-to-end -end manufacturing process flow analytics and, and also to monitor the safety, safety standards and, and violations in real time. You know, you want to, uh, you know, if, if you see violations, um, and it's not about, it's not about um, stopping people doing their job but it's just about making the factory floor safer um, and you know you can send alerts real time to to people and um, make make your day-to-day -day job a, a more safe and 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 better place to be um so it's a safe work is 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 you know it needs to become a standard practice for maintained um on the assembly line and a safe and healthy factory is is um is repositioned as a as a revenue positive by, lim by limiting the impact of concerns and violations for all stakeholders, um, from individual workers to the employer themselves. And, and again, customers appreciate products uh, manufactured by, by workers in safe and healthy factories. So it has uh, multiple, multiple areas. Vulcan, Vulcan Steel is, is one of those case studies that you know, they used computer vision um, across, their, across, their, um, across their floors. Um, and uh, each individual employee has um, has a set of practices that they're allowed to do and has training that goes through the systems. And you know, if for example, a worker picks up a picks, picks up a you know a skill saw or something that they that they're not really trained to use, they can um, you can send alerts to those individuals to say you know you're not really supposed to do that. But more importantly, if there's a spill somewhere in the floor um, or or any other thing that you can think that you can detect with 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 cameras and computer vision and and smart um, alerts or to to individuals to make to make them a lot a lot safer, they they've heavily adopted it. Um, so remote working productivity again, you know, yeah. annual cost of of cybersecurity damages this year, uh, it'll cost businesses six trillion um, across the globe. So it's 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 fairly significant. Um, so forty percent of data on IOTs on IOT devices will be stored, processed, and examined using cloud technology by the end of the year. So there's there's a lot more uh, a lot more data being pushed up to the clouds, whether it's ours or on or on any of the others. And and um, again, the data that you get out of that is is where it's where you get the most use. Is 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 how you can uh, make your work more productive, productive. 
Um, so uh, some of the AI transformation things is, you know, make use of AI to digitally transform unstructured technical documentation into actionable data in near real time. So, you know, you, you want to make use of this stuff as soon as possible. Um, some of the solutions we had was we've got formula recognizer that transforms large volumes of unstructured data um, um, into, into actionable data, sorry, un unstructured, unstructured documentation into actionable data. Um, and then you can parse that with semantics in, in mind and mark up for knowledge mining and, and how are you going to use that later on for, for you know, in forward, forward leverage the actionable data in, in, in custom, custom analytics and, and derive some actually really unique insights from that. And, you know, by some of the outcomes of all of that, is you, you know, you're going to improve your operations. Um, and uh, by, by having that, that actionable data and then completely avoid laborious, repetitive, time consuming and, and let's face it, error prone processes. You kind of, you know, I, I, I my have a background as a developer and an engineer, and if I, if I ever have to write anything twice, I, I, I automate it. And even now, with with some of the tools that that we've got available, it makes that a lot easier. In your day, in my day to day job, I automate processes as much as possible. Um. So ABB is a is is one of the case studies that we have around here. Um. And they're, they wanted to, re, you know, re, reduce outage and work, um, and and they've done they've done that with some of the solutions they're using uh, across Azure. They're they're, they're building a lot of, um, they're using a lot of the platform, but uh, you know it's greater efficiency and and scalability and and you know they're continuously innovation to innovating to lower the costs that they have. Um, and something Daniel said uh, at the start as well. Don't you know, these these uh, capabilities that we have here are are available and accessible now. And you know you can start with a pilot at at, at relatively reduced cost. It doesn't need to boil the ocean. You know you can have start with very small processes. Um, so again, John talked about this at the at the start. You know, process and workflow automation. Um, you know, executives are planning to to um, develop hybrid models for production and not production over the next three years. So there's not going to be just all uh, running manual or all running in the cloud. It's going to be a mix and match. It's going to be a lot of hybrid process across the across everything that we do. Um, and you know, manuf manufacturers who actually do believe that selling products and services, um, you know, will improve their bottom line. It's 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 going to you know it's growing by eighty three percent. So the, there's a lot of different trends across that, and and, and some of this, the transformation that we're seeing is, um, <clears throat> uh, we want to make use of of AI to digitally stim stimulate complex systems in, again in near real time. And again, there's another example of forms, um, forms uh, recognizer using unstructured maintenance assets, but also using robotic process automation to fuel digital twins um, with maintenance and performance data uh, for co-evolving evolving simula um, simulation. Um, and again, some of the outcomes out of this is to uh, optimize efficiency and reduce costs. Yeah, you need to be conscious of um, Chevron is um, is a good example around this. They've uh, they've um, they reduced. Uh, they they're now enabling new opportunities for truly innovative products, and um, they're uh, they're they're starting to use artificial intelligence don't it? they're on the very early early cusps of it and also with robotic process automation which as john mentioned at the very start you know it's 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 spreading across a lot of organizations it's it's a lot of organizations using rpa and it's become a real buzzword in the last couple of years um and you know from sourcing data to, uh, to automation uh, it's extraction it's extraction from entry into back end systems so just one thing I wanted to mention as well, you know, it's it's um, we're we're fairly committed to advancement of AI driven by ethical principles, 
uh, that put people first. You know, it's really important that you know we we uh, go into using artificial intelligence responsibly, and and this means that you know um, the technology we bring to our partners must adhere to you know some of the principles that you're seeing here: transparency and privacy and security, but also um, accountability and inclusion and fairness. Um, so that you know, customers can build with confidence, knowing that they own and control their data. We are not looking to own or control anybody's data, um, but we're we're just supplying the products that must adhere to these kind of things that we see on screen. Um, so we're putting our principles into practices and and taking a people centered approach to to research and development uh, and deployment of artificial intelligence. Um, so you know we embrace diverse perspectives and continuous learning and agile responsive, responsiveness as AI technology involves. So in summary, um, AI transforms maintenance from a, from a reactive pursuit into a proactive one, um, a pursuit that can be that can even become increasingly uh, prescriptive with experience. Um, informed, informed by the broadest and deepest array of data, AI can reliably anticipate the needs of supplier wherever they may be, and, and then in doing that, influence and influence and, and uh, a dynamic supply chain. Also, AI, you know, ensures that focus remains consistently on safe and high quality environments from an end to end on the assembly line and and to be in, in in real time when a situation warrants um, decisive action. And lastly, make use of AI to digitally transform unstructured technical documentation and operational logs into actual data in you know as close and near time as possible. So uh, with that, um, I thank you very much. And like I say, reach out to me if you need. And, um, and thanks, John, for having me. And uh, I hope to pull back time a little bit for you. So I'll, uh, I'll stop thank there. You. Thank you very much. Um, are there any questions for Ray at this stage? No questions. I can. Yeah, I just wanted to quickly ask Raymond. Maybe, you know, I know Microsoft do a lot of work with businesses to help them develop their their own strategy, or even sort of help them to define it. Can you tell us a little bit about how Microsoft Azure and all the platforms that Microsoft um, can offer? You know, there's kind of incubators and there's support to help you define. You know what is your actual potential for AI and automation and you know, lean agile production management and what you can do? Could you just give us a little, maybe tell us about those incubators? Sure. Um, so the area that I work in is um, is it's kind of an in the enterprise sales component, and we uh, my team are are kind of a team of of. Apps and application and infrastructure specialists, as well as application modernization specialists um, and data and AI. So we kind of cover a broad range of everything to do with Azure really. And then other components of my team co cover um, the other two clouds as we call them. Um, so Office 365 and Dynamics 365. So we cover, and that covers robotic process automation. And we work very closely with customers to, for really, for me, it's not about, it's not about not leading with the products. That is by far down the back line. What we work with customers is um, understand where you're trying to get to. You know, what does what does your what does your cloud strategy look like? And and we've got a lot of documentation around this and how we provide that and how we work with you over and back and what what does that look like? What's your roadmap? What's your roadmap for projects um, that we can line up with you and support on? Um, how ready are you? How ready are our customers? Um, and uh, John, I think he'll, he'll jump into a little bit later on about about the around uh, what we have for for learning and and how we share that out to, to everybody because it's it's a very open component. And lastly, most importantly, what does success look like for you? Because the last thing we want to do is just, and we, we, this used to be the very, very old Microsoft is we just wanted to sell licensed products. They, we're not like that anymore at all. It's very much what does, what is your, what, what, what is the thing you're trying to achieve and then work closely on that. And that could be 
and you know like uh, is easing up some of the robotic process of or easing some easing up some of the financial mundane things that you have to task or or whatever it can be and i'm only talking about the a very very small component of of the organization that we have right now but we've also got um a team of customer success unit it's called the customer success unit who have a cloud solution architects who have customer success managers who have you know a vast array of people and then outside of all that we've got access to people across all of western europe and and globally uh, we've got a team of what, what we call fast track individuals these are engineers who actually build the products and and are have moving from an engineer role but working with customers um to to uh, you know be part of those incubators like you said and define what you're trying to get out of success. So there's there's a there's an endless amount of people and capability that we can bring to bear as well. So um, I, I could probably go on about this for me, itself for for a couple of hours, but um, maybe something known and we can talk about another time as well and bring into more detail. Raymond, if I could maybe just ask ask a question. I I, I worked in the Middle East for a number of years, and we had a business we used as your uh, and uh, we were building a software platform. But at that time, this is a couple of years ago, maybe a year ago, there were some of your modules, as I would think of them as, you know, the AI modules were coming on stream. Some of them were being prototyped. They weren't available somewhere. They were yep. essentially ML AI uh, predictive. We had massive amounts of data coming in, so it was using those tools. One of the areas that we are looking at here is assisting companies add as much value to their food and agri products as possible. So we think of primary producers who are making something here. They may have a waste material or the way, or indeed even in the primary product, uh, helping them. We, we, we're looking at data mining. So we're, we're sort of mining their, uh, mining the product. So for example, for us, we would look at say, I mentioned uh, one of the questions earlier, we, we might look at, are there any valuable proteins contained within this product? Or yeah. is there a precursor to a valuable component? So we may need to chop it, slice it, dice it to make it higher value. Um, and that strikes me as there's two, there's two things here. There's a massive amount of, of potential data. Uh, I mean, in pharmaceutical development, they talk about combinatorial libraries. These are massive libraries where they run thousands of, of samples against likely candidates. Oh, sorry, or they run thousands of candidates that. against likely like, like, Lightly effects. So with this sort of thing, you would be you would be mining the. I use that word because I don't really know how to describe it any better than that. But you would essentially be disaggregating the product, looking for components of of value, whether they were therapeutic value or whether it was just something else. Um, so you might be wanting to identify, say, proteins, for example. That's one high value. That could be an enzyme. It could be a potential therapeutic agent. Whatever. How would you combine the sort of yeah. gathering of the data, in other words, the, 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 the sort of synthesizing, manipulating of the DNA or the proteins or whatever you're looking at? How, how would you integrate that into the Azure platform? Because you're going to get a lot of data. I know Azure is good at handling that. And I know you have a, a sort of suite of interpretive tools emerging in the sort of AI area. I mean, you know, could, for example, could you... Could could we potentially, you know, you think of this as a, I think in terms of projects here, and it's just a thought, um, but you know, could we apply that, put that, plug that data into Azure, and then Azure run its AI using the power of the of, of the Azure platform, and I, and I know a fair, well, not, I know a little bit about it, so I know what it's capable of. Um, also, know how much you charge <laughs> when, when you start throwing when you start throwing some real computing yeah. power at it. Yeah. But um, is, is, is that type of, to me, it's a very futuristic way of, it sort of talks to what John is, is trying to do here, taking a system that goes on anyway, but it's very laborious, it's done in labs, it's, you know, I mean, pharmaceutical drug, drug discovery has benefited from, from, from all of this technology. So how can, how can we look at um, you know, existing producers, uh, is there any more value in their product? For example, does their waste fat contain valuable enzymes, as an example? No, it probably does, but uh, 
So if we can break that thing down, look inside it, then the question then comes, is there a way to plug that data into a system that can effectively use MLAI to interrogate it to say, actually, there are some precursors here. You didn't spot them. They're here. Um, I mean, I know Microsoft, I and mean, I always thought of Microsoft, you know, somebody was saying the other day, I was listening to one of the podcasts, they said, you know, you don't think of Microsoft as an exciting company. He said, but they are. I mean, you're looking at D you know, DNA fingerprinting of products. You're looking at DNA as a data storage thing. So it's it sort of, that got me thinking about if you combine that level of, of information with the sort of AI and the power of the cloud, you know, is that, is there something there? I'm maybe not explaining this. No, you are, you, you are. Um, so uh, absolutely. And we have, we have um, case studies and examples, but I'll talk a little bit about the process um, and how probably Azure has, has evolved over the last couple of years to, to, to expand out on not just being a machine learning component. So the way we talk about it now is you, you do your ingestion. Right. So um, you your ingestion can be from anything, you know, whether that's a whether that's um, a watch or, you know, a fitness tracker as part of, you know, something going on or the phone or a computer or a spreadsheet or whatever it is. And we've got a, a suite of tools that does the ingestion. So Azure Data Factory is probably one of the main components there that does um, that does an ingestion of data or that you can use to do an ingestion of data. And some of the some of the things about that now is it doesn't matter what kind of data it is. It used to have to be a SQL database, but now it could be, you know, a MySQL database, a Postgres database. It could be a CSV file. It could be anything. And you can use Azure Data Factory to ingest that data. The next thing you want, you want to do is once you've ingested it, you need somewhere to store it. Um, and then it depends on, on what you want to do with that data. Do you just want to store it for archive purposes? And then if you do, then you want to store it in a cold storage, some kind of cold storage, whether it's table storage or, or an Azure Data Lake or a, or a, a SQL database. And the, the, the capabilities around that are just endless. But the thing about it is it's important to know what you're going to do with the data and how you're what you're going to do on top. And then after that, once you've stored it, then you start to analyze it. And then you start to run uh, models on top of that. You can you can use machine learning. You can use data break components. You can use um, it, it depends on the crunching and the and the levels of crunching that you want to do on top of that data. And you're analyzing and you use all the analyzing suite of tools that we have around that. OK, if I, if I can stop you there. I, I, yep. yep. I get the ingestion, I get the storage and I get the analysis. I mean, you'd probably end up with a data lake because you'd have information on compounds. Some of them could be fat, some of them could be protein, some of it could be DNA, you know, you could, well, that's protein, but you know, so you, you could have this amorphous data lake of information, which you, you know, my interpretation of AI is, it's, you know, slightly different from John's, but we always viewed it as, it's looking at a data lake and, you know, the human can't see it. Yeah. They can't see the, the associations and the trends in that data. And whether that's from a factory or whether it's, you know, massive amount. I mean, we, we were collecting transport data. So you, you can see trends and patterns. You can overlay weather. You can overlay so much. And I saw it working in real time. And it's very effective at predictive, but not, not like predictive maintenance, but predictive in other ways. So when you come to analyze that, you what I'm saying, does Microsoft have the capacity to say, you know, you need to know what you're analyzing it for? I mean, would you be able to say, you know, or where would you access the data to say this compound, say, for example, has is a potentially valuable uh, therapeutic protein? Mm. You know, um, so you. I get your point. You've got the ingestion, you've got the storage, you're analyzing, but you're analyzing it against what, you know, you're looking for what, I mean, would you have, do you have the databases to say, like, for example, databases of proteins or, 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 or no, I suppose that's it. That's again, uh, maybe something that um, I, I, we don't store data. We're a user of data. We, we store it in the cloud, but it's always someone else's data, if you know what I mean. Um, we're a data store, data, we, but we can 
you can, like, I'm assuming there's open source libraries getting that kind of data though, that you could ingest as well as part of an ingestion component and store it all. And then you could use artificial intelligence to create models and run the, the, the protein or whatever it is against, against the data that you have. Um, so we wouldn't have a database databases off that kind of data, but if there's open source libraries and open source data that exists in the world that you can pull in and run against your own data, then you can use machine learning and cognitive services and knowledge mining, uh, all the other components around that. But the thing about that, the thing the probably misconception around machine learning is, is not just a, I flick a switch on my data and I'm now it's and now yeah, I've now got artificial intelligent insights using machine learning on top of it. It's models that you need to build on your data and train it. So as soon as you build the model, it needs to be run all, um, you know, multiple times, pulling them together and train the models around it. I suppose in that example, then your models, the models that you would be training it against are, you know, for example, existing therapeutics, existing high value. Exactly. Proteins, ex so you, you, you tip all of that into the data lake and, you know, you, I suppose you, depending on how you set the parameters. Okay, I don't want to monopolize this, but I think, okay. I, so that's clarified. I, I, I was thinking the analysis bit was something but you're right, you tip everything into the data lake and you strip the and you search the data lake for the associations and the and the and the correlations and the connection. Okay, thank you. No problem, okay, David. You just caused another few sleepless nights for me. <laughs> so we we um uh, on our journey through this afternoon, we we covered a lot of questions and answers along the way. So although the agenda calls it out as a separate section, we we kind of covered it along the way. Does anyone have any more questions for Ray before we move on from his uh, update? Could I just ask you, Ray, sorry again, does, do you collaborate on, for example, like uh, uh, Horizon Europe projects? Would you be a partner in that, for example? Let's say we had a project together with two or three concerns. I mean, would you be a, like a technical partner in that? Is that something that Microsoft has done in the past? So it's probably more so we'd be work in conjunction with other partners within sort of areas because we have like hundreds and hundreds of partners thousands of partners across Europe and we would be more of a supplier of products and information rather than uh, now I'm talking about my area we've also got an area called Microsoft Consultant Services that is that would be a prod, a partner that would support to build solutions and be um, involved in that whereas I am um we're really information givers and enablers in in my area but microsoft consultant services is very much like a partner that would do some of that work as well as well as all the other partners that we have that we um that we uh partner with and work with but if if that was a potential project that would create a competency for microsoft that then would allow you to commercially exploit that and offer that service to say other other regions, other companies, other providers, you know, whether it's a academics or whether it's, it's you know, companies in, in, in the food, you know, new product development or the food and development sector, that type of thing. You know, I'm um, talking about, you know, it's, it's an area of potential value. Yeah. You, you would become the technology, I mean, to my mind, you would become one of the technology providers. And it was sort of, it, it's not something you provide at the moment. It's maybe something that you would want to develop a core competency in so you can offer it to other companies, other users. Yeah, um, I mean, look, at, I think yeah, I think I think that's you know, Microsoft is always looking for new avenues, but unfortunately that's way above my pay grade to be able to decide what kind of avenues we down. That's that's up Sachi to the Della's uh, route and, and Corp in, in but look, yeah, there's a, there's always been new partners and we we invest heavily in startup organizations as well. Um, we do a lot of work with startup organizations. So, you know, if that's kind of area as well, then, you know, our startup hub would be would be a good place to interact with. And what is the startup hub? Um, so I'll, uh, I'll, I'll share some I, I can, I'll, I'll no. share some info with John that we can. Yeah. And it's because links. There's also, people. But there's also the Microsoft Learn. Yeah. Um, a, a lot of um, when, when you think about all the technology from Microsoft, um, it can seem overwhelming when you look at the entire wall of you know, lists of options, right? But one of the great things Microsoft offers is, uh, uh, you know, 
online free learning on things. So the, the, the whole point here is to work out the strategy and then to work out, okay, based on that strategy, our organization needs to learn about um, Microsoft IoT, Azure machine learning, or whatever it might be. And then there's structured training to bring people up to date with the specific way that that technology works and then decide, is that for them or is it a competitor, right? Moving further on from there, um, if there's a specific project, we have a way of working with Microsoft on specific projects. Um, if Microsoft, and this is what Ray is alluding to, if Microsoft like a project, if they see it as inherently innovative, um, Microsoft will provide resource to that project. Um, they have a long track record of, of, of helping organizations with complex problems. At the end of the day, Microsoft is a commercial organization. It's looking for revenue, obviously, but it's prepared to invest, invest. to help bring a business along. Yeah. Yeah, I understand. I just wondered if that was something that uh, that, uh, that that they'd done before. Yeah. Okay, I know they looked for. I, I know they've operated in other territories, not Ireland, in, in that way, mm -hmm. where they've partnered uh, yep. on a sort of development project, not yeah. our, but, but big D project. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. No problem. Thanks, David. Thanks, David. So we'll we'll move on to the final part. I know it's coming up to four thirty. I'm very conscious of the time. So we've covered a lot on questions and answers. Um. So the, the next piece is really about how to get started. So <clears throat> we're already in conversation with, with several organizations. Essentially the mechanism we follow is to begin with an idea, but convert that idea into a plan <clears throat> from which um, the, pro you know, the, the project can, can, uh, can be uh, executed. So plan and execute. In execution, when we're looking at machine learning in particular, we're talking about looking for patterns in the data, trying to determine, is there an algorithm? Is there a machine learning algorithm that we can find? So where you have a problem relating to yield or loss or throughput time or you know, error reduction, <clears throat> there's, a, there's typically a cause and effect equation, an algorithm, an equation. And a lot of the work in the analysis activity is to find what is that, how close can you get to that perfect equation? And then based on that, the recommendation to, you know, to address the, the underlying issue, which is either a yield issue, throughput time issue, an error issue, whatever it might be. From there, a set of improvements are identified. They're either implemented or they're so big, they can't just be implemented. They require a phase two investment. So if, if it's a case of, you know, it's, it becomes obvious that flat factory floor robots are needed. Well, then that's the recommendation that comes out of the exercise. Um, if, if the predictive algorithms need further work, then that's, that's what comes out of the exercise. So the project, an incubator project is all about getting a quick win, but leading into what's next. Investing in any of this down the line in, in relation to what's next is all about uh, cost benefit analysis. So the templates that we use, firstly, we have, an, we have a, an application form. Many of you on the call from enterprises have seen this application form. And it's really about capturing on two pages, um, both shown here, what is the project about? Uh, to describe it in terms of uh, uh, what, what will happen in, is it, a, is it a process improvement or a product improvement or a service improvement? What is it broadly? And then what benefit do you think it will bring to your business? You know, who, who from the team might be available? Uh, for example, someone like, say, Porig Malin in, in, uh, picked at random there. Commitment, what commitment can be made? And then what data is available? And then what ambition do you have down the line for that particular project? When you then look at um, moving into the world of data, it then, it then becomes sensitive. You're not thinking of, okay, well, look, uh, the sense, commercially sensitive data needs to be protected and also proprietary information. And uh, for, you know, for a project to be successful, there has to be some openness, but that has to be protected. So we have a mutual non-disclosure agreement that we put in place on that basis. And then um, we have um, a project charter document, which again, I think some of you on the call have already seen. The idea of this is, this is a template 
which, which is very comprehensive, but it's a case of saying, look, I don't need to fill in all these sections, but there certainly is a, a core thing around assumptions and risk relating to my project that I do want to describe. Maybe organizational context is not relevant, but maybe I do want to talk about benefits. The idea here is that you know, we, want to, we want to clarify the project charter so that we're clear on what is the start and what is the end and what are we trying to achieve and what are the milestones and what are the deliverables. So um, with, with the organizations we're currently talking to, the next phase is all about getting this uh, completed. So we're very clear about scope. And then we're very clear about, you know, what's the intention. Now, um, we will be going through a process of facilitated uh, scope creation. So I'll, I'll, I'll provide a, a resource to assist each organization to get that to happen. So people aren't trying to fill it in on their own, um, if, if it seems daunting to clarify this. But it's, it's I suppose, it, the clearer we can be about the outcome expected, the more likely it is that we'll be successful. And then during the during the execution of the project, what we do is we we have a regular project update to describe, you know, what what is the purpose of the project, the, you know, what resourcing is available, is it still available, and then overall project process uh, uh, progress. Red, amber, green. Are we on track? Um, on upskilling, just to move on from that, our Next, our next training actually uh, is next Thursday and, and the following Thursday. Now, today's event was very much informative. Bring some expert speakers onto the call, give everyone some ideas around what's possible, what's available. The next two courses are very practical and hands-on and they're typically geared at technical staff rather than business leaders, but everyone is invited to come along whatever way you you interpret yourself as a business leader or a technical expert but the idea is that we want to show um businesses in our region how to get started with ai in practical terms and we'll have a, a technology expert um on the call next thursday the following week it goes just a level deeper so these are two sessions they're about three hours each and they go deep and then deeper still there's only so much you can cover in in a pair of three hour sessions but it it's about getting people thinking and understanding the terminology a bit better. And then as they tune into their project, they, they have a clear understanding of what's possible. Um, we track everything on our website. We also have our LinkedIn page where we publish um, updates. And what we will do for today's call, this will be captured as a video, which will circulate. We we'll also publish it on our website. That is everything we have on the agenda for today. But before I close the call, does anyone have any final thoughts or any, any final questions? Or is, 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 it, uh, is it all clear? <laughs> okay, well, if, if, if there are no further questions, I just wanna thank everybody who has uh, stayed on the call for the uh, for the time and um, look forward to working with you again in the, in the future and uh, feel free to drop a line at any time to me by email or phone or whatever and um, we'll uh, we'll follow up from there thanks John. thanks so much everyone thank thanks, thanks everybody. everybody thank you very much that was very interesting thank you all right thank Take you John. thank you Thanks, Dan. Bye. Bye now. Thanks, John. Uh, that was cool. And I look forward to next week. Thank you. Thank you, Ronan. I, I, I have to actually go. My son was, was not too well, so I need to go anyway. So, um, yeah. Right, we should listen to talk next week, John. Yeah, let's do that, Ronan. Thank you. Hope he's All okay. Right. Thank you. Yeah, ah, yeah, yeah. No, he, well, I'll tell you soon. <laughs> okay. Thanks, John. God bless. No problem. Take care, everybody, and uh, have a safe evening.